YouTube, it's Brad Phillips. Finally, we're doing the Mini Apprentice, which is a 1.2 meter, except this isn't the Mini Apprentice either. It's just the Apprentice S2, which means safe. This has full safe. It's a ready to fly or bind and fly. Today, we're testing it in the bind and fly, or excuse me, in the ready to fly configuration. And we will at some point uh, in the future, go ahead and do a bind and fly. But for now, Everything is set up. The only thing we did that was uh, deviating from the instruction manual is we put our control horns, we put the clevis on the inside hole on both sides, okay? And on the, the rudder and the elevator. And then the instruction manual called for the outside hole. So other than that, everything is exactly stock. So we're gonna test this. This is a 1300 3S 30C Gen 1 Smart Pack, which was provided uh, in the ready to fly combo. So here we go guys. We're probably gonna have to do a little bit of trimming, but that's no biggie. I love the way the ground handling is about 15% throttle here. There is feedback for battery pack voltage right here. I love the way this plane flies. Full disclosure, this is our second time flying this plane. We actually, it's more like the fifth time flying our plane if you count all the takeoffs and landings, 50th. <laughs> because this thing, look at that guys, 15% throttle, just cruising around at a safe here. This is obviously a safe creature, so here's safe. The camera crew actually did fly it. We had a bit of an issue on one of our gimbals. We'll go over the details. If you want to stick around, we'll show you exactly how we figured out what was going on and how we resolved it. It's a little bit tedious, but it's all about learning on this channel. So if you wanna watch, go for it. Otherwise, we are calling it almost an insane level of flukeism because we have never ever had that happen except for one time on one more XK helicopter. So we're calling it a fluke for now, but we, we still wanna share the experience. We love reviewing these planes and we wanna give a fair crack uh, to any of the companies we work with. Horizon has been excellent to work with and we almost never have issues like that. Beautiful acrobatic capabilities or aerobatic capabilities. Acrobats are people, aerobatic are planes. Did you know that? Was that how the differentiation goes? Yeah. That's something I learned after doing this channel for a little bit. Some people corrected me. Weird. I know. It's hard to believe. <laughs> You may have noticed that this thing flies awesome because it does. Camera crew, you wanna come a couple steps forward. Now, also full disclosure, we had some crop dusting activity going across the street. And when I say across the street, it's about a mile down the road. So we've got lots of area left and no risk of populating the same airspace. But remember guys, if you're flying a radio controlled airplane, you always yield to manned aircraft, no matter how far away you think they are. You gotta play it safe because there's lives on the line with that. This plane would not stand a chance against the plane they were using the crop dust. And they are about a hundred miles away from us probably now because we watched them flying away. So beautiful, beautiful night, dead calm. And that's the nights you're gonna tend to see them crop dusting. And that's one thing you need to keep in mind if you do fly radio controlled airplanes out in the middle of nowhere, kind of like what we do. I haven't gone over, I think about 50% throttle, 40% throttle, 30% throttle. Guys, this thing is so efficient and amazing. I just love looping it around in close tight areas because it flies so dang good. Watch this landing guys. I'm off the wheel. See that guys? It's just so dang good. I flew the 1.5 meter apprentice for the first time. I had a friend who was more or less getting out of the hobby. He was kind of too busy with his work and he had a lot of other planes and things that over the years he had helped, uh, it really helped me out a lot when I was first getting into the hobby. He had given me a bunch of stuff. His name is Tom, I'll leave it at that. Um, Tom, if you're watching, thank you by the way. That was really nice and really appreciated because back when we started this channel, we certainly weren't working with any companies. We certainly didn't ever get a free plane, that's for sure, except when it came to working with Tom because he gave me a few, <laughs> uh, more than a few things. Let's just put it that way. 
and it was always very much appreciated. Well, anyway, one of the very amazing gifts that he gave our family was an Apprentice 1.5. And he had, I don't know if he maybe like tumbled it in the grass a couple of times, but otherwise it was like brand new. I went and crashed it on my maiden flight. And I knew every I knew everything I was doing, except I forgot that it was an old safe which meant that I had to initiate it with a power switch while sitting level. I instead initiated it upside down. So when I turned the safe on, the plane went where it thought home was. Home was, I'll demonstrate, something like that. Of course, it went like, I'm in safe now. <laughs> it went something like this. except I, I simulated the crash for you. And it broke my heart because the plane was brand new and it flew so stinking good. That was quite the touch and go. <laughs> so anyway, guys, if you are intermediate in your skill level, or if you are just learning the hobby, Safe is a great way to help save your planes, but if you're going between modes like I was there when I just did that unplanned touch and go, yes, that was unplanned, I went from intermediate to advanced, and I didn't realize I wasn't in advanced, and that's why it wasn't going down all the way. So, it can happen, just be careful. Switching between modes on a safe, a full safe plane, not a safe select plane, uh, can get you into some strange considerations. The difference between full safe and uh, safe select is that in safe select, you're only going to have safe on auto leveling and limited bank angles, or as configured if you're in an Air 637T or 631 that you have programmed as a plug and fly. And on full safe, you're going to have auto leveling and limited bank angles for beginner. And they're gonna also many times mix in a rudder to aileron mix, or excuse me, rather an aileron to rudder mix. And they're also gonna limit the throws almost like a low rates. And then in intermediate, they're going to limit your bank angles. I'll show you what this looks like. So I'm in intermediate. So they're limiting your bank angles, but it doesn't automatically level. Whoa. It does allow you to flip over when you have your control horns at the furthest inside because you get more output. So you can overwhelm the system. So like we suggested in the video, if you're new to the hobby, and you're a generic new pilot, don't do anything that the manual doesn't suggest. I am a little bit more than intermediate pilot, so I can handle it with those inside holes. It gives me more throw, so I can make the plane do things like yawing a little bit faster than what you might be able to accomplish otherwise. See this, how tight it is? See that rudder? You gotta really get into your throttle. I'm about 80% throttle here. Good way to crash your plane doing this here, by the way, guys. Look how flat that is. <laughs> I about lost it there. So, just to be clear, if you go to the inside holes, you can also make more aggressive elevator pitch control. See this? And you can also get into places where it will tip stall very badly. Now, if you're doing as the manual prescribes, you won't generally have that problem because this plane is extremely forgiving, even in experienced mode. Okay, so I'm just gonna walk over to the bowl and check for manned aircraft. Oh, look up there. He's up there, do you see? Yep. Okay, guys, you see him up there? He's probably a mile to two miles to our, what direction is that? That'd be north, mm -hmm. right? North. Yeah, east. so he's a long ways away and he's not going for our property, obviously. So know your surroundings if you're flying near agricultural areas and it's crop dusting time. Look at that beauty though, folks. It is just amazing to fly this plane. It's one of the best flying, ready to fly planes. I would argue that the Aero Scout 
1.1 is one of the most approachable planes, but I feel like this plane flies a little bit better. Also, I feel like it's a little bit more expensive, so that might disclude a few of you if you're trying to get the cheapest entry-level plane. But that being said, this is ready to fly. It's got a similar battery, That's it is the same battery. So if you decide to get a ready to fly, like the Aero Scout, then you can get this as bind and fly and you won't be compromising a thing. Look at this, guys. Just perfect landings. It will do grass. Okay, hold on. We're gonna just tip it back. It will do grass takeoffs and landings if your grass is short enough. I just don't wanna cut up the grass because it's now been a couple of days since I mowed the grass here. So we'll show you that on the sod where it's a little bit more well manicured. This is the sod over here, closer to the house, obviously. By the way, if you're wondering what that is, that's a bug zapper. The taxiing and ground handling is very good. Be very careful about bumps in your yard. So I'm gonna taxi back out. Bumps onto your driveway, for instance. Okay, just to show you, you just use a lot of up elevator to get the nose up and then it flies just fine. And by the way, this is absolutely what I would consider to be a park flyer. But if you're new to flying, just know the rules in your area, follow the rules if you so choose, but be careful if you are not. There are some pretty steep penalties and fines and things that can be levied against you. And uh, there is a website that the FAA has called Know Before You Fly. If it's over 250 grams, generically, you need to have a pseudo license, whatever they call it. It's like $5 that lasts for three years and you have to display your number on the outside and then follow a few different pretty basic rules. It's not a big deal. Um, if you are flying in a professional manner, like suppose you're flying a drone to film wedding photography or you know real estate, then you have to get what's called a part 107 exemption. And a part 107 exemption is going to, oh, I was an intermediate that whole time. Ha, <laughs> almost did it again. A part 107 exemption, see I'm upside down so I know I'm out of intermediate. is going to be like pilot license light. The biggest part of a part 107, which I don't have one yet, maybe someday, is that you need to know about air spaces. Air spaces, the controlled air spaces is the biggest factor that the FAA has really missed the boat on. There are many different types of air spaces classified within our country, within the national airspace. And my understanding is that the national airspace, the NAS, didn't start until 1,000 feet except for where there's an airport present. So if they could just classify radio-controlled airplanes different than they classify fully autonomous drones, they could resolve 99% of the problems that we all have with the rules. But for the moment, we're operating within, and they have backed off of some of the most ridiculous stuff they came up with the other year. So do your own research. Park flying is one of my favorite aspects of the hobby. So the best thing you can do for the hobby is try not to tick people off. If they're annoyed, go find another place. But how could you be annoyed watching something like this? <laughs> I mean, seriously, I just don't, I don't, I can't even comprehend it. If you, I used to fly at a park where we lived before, which is, you know, like 20 minutes from here. And the kids would come out and watch every time. And I mean, not just like one, like 30. And it was just like an awesome thing. The kids loved it and we loved it. And it was just a great, positive, uh, wholesome experience. There was, you know, absolutely nothing that you could say that was inappropriate um, or negative about the whole situation. So, What a beautiful sunset, by the way, mm -hmm. look at this thing. So guys, um, if you're flying this plane, you can see that flashing light. There's one dot left and it's flashing. So that means that 
we're about ready to run out of juice at some point. Now, if I back off the throttle, it may actually come back a little bit, but the camera crew is desperate to fly this for you. Isn't that true? I don't know if desperate is the word. Desperately don't want to? <laughs> oh, is that what it was? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna plop in a 2200 milliamp just to show you that it'll fit. We answer a million questions that you may be having in our unbox, build, and radio setup, which is like, turn this on. There's no radio setup because this isn't programmable, but we do that routinely, and we will help teach you, if you're a brand new pilot, um, kind of how to go through the process of unboxing a plane, getting it ready to fly. And no, it's not a 10 minute video, it's long, but there's many things that come up that may be helpful to you if you really are truly a noob and you don't know what you're doing. We're gonna help bring you from a box that FedEx delivered and you don't really know much of anything other than that's a plane, it has a wing on it, and we'll take you to the next level. Now this video is very detailed and it's very long and tedious. If you guys know this stuff, you probably won't wanna watch it because it's so, so noob level uh, information but we, we never wanna turn down somebody that's learning to fly. That's one of our principal um, endeavors on this channel is to, first of all, help you guys spend your RC dollars. That's how you help support us financially by following links to this plane, transmitters and things like this. This of course comes with the plane and then the batteries and things that you can buy from Horizon Hobby and then anything else they sell on the website. That's the number one way you can support us. But we wanna support you in turn by helping bring more people to the hobby. And when we say more people, we don't mean like 50. We mean like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of new people to the hobby because we need more people in this hobby so that we can have legislative strength. Uh, we need to have people uh, that are doing the right thing and you know operating in safe ways and doing things that are uh, just helping the world to see that this is this is not only a wholesome thing. It's a great. It's a safe thing. It's it's really a fun thing. It's you know kids nowadays are on screens all the time. So that's why I don't want to beat up RC simulators. We have reviewed them and we encourage you to use them if necessary. But the thing is, what is better than flying a little airplane around the yard? I mean, it's so much fun. What other uh, wholesome activity can you set your kids at where they can spend? hours a week staying out of trouble. I mean, there's just, everybody's concerned about, you know, safety like nannyism. For God's sake, this is one of the safest, most wholesome things you can do right now. And you can enjoy it as an adult with your parents. You can enjoy it as an adult with your kids. Your kids can enjoy it with their grandparents, maybe even great grandparents. You know, what other multi-generational activity can you really put down on paper that you can do with everybody and still legitimately enjoy the process? So this is, this is a powerful tool to keep family connections. It's something that's really important. I feel like it's a way to tie the communities together. So there's so many positive things and attributes about flying radio controlled airplanes. And it is, by the way, the most immersive and the most fun radio controlled experience you're going to have driving cars, boats, submarines, helicopters, quads, they're all fun, but flying fixed wing planes is the most fun. It's also the most hard to learn, I think. So between that and helis, so quads can be very hard, but most people don't really fly quads, flight controllers fly them. So with that being said, we're gonna switch batteries and we're gonna give the camera crew a chance to show just how easy this plane is to fly for a beginner. She's gonna take off and land on her own. I'm gonna give her lots of support and do a horrible job filming. Mm -hmm. So please forgive us. This plane uh, comes ready to fly with the battery that we flew on. So let's just show you how it's set up here. We got plenty of power to get back to our feet. Um, just, we'll show you what we've got left in the battery. We'll use the XPC battery checker. Okay, so safe is off. So we only have AS3X on here right now. AS3X is what's on when you're in, ex in experienced mode or expert mode. Okay, so this is an IC3 connector. It has a smart lead, a main discharge lead, positive and negative. Positive is this, negative is this. This is a balance lead. Since this is a Gen 1 pack, there's still a balance lead. Gen 2 packs do not have a balance lead. Do you have the other battery there, camera crew? Mm -hmm. I can hold this. Um, the new Gen 2, battery leads are just the main discharge lead like this, okay? 
So you have the smart, that gray wire, that transmits information back and forth from the chip on here that also balances the pack. So that takes a lot of the guesswork out of running uh, or playing with lipos. Lipos are one of the only dangerous things in this entire hobby, and they're only as dangerous as you let them. So the second thing you gotta watch out for in this hobby is just the fact that you don't cut your hand, and we talk about throttle cuts a lot. Throttle cuts are basically a switch that you use. Okay, so this is the 3S 1300 milliamp pack that came with this, it's 30C. So that stands for three cells in series, and that's 1300 milliamps each. 1300 milliamps is 1.3 amp hours. That's a rating of capacity. It tells you how long you can fly with it or how much you can use to consume X amount of energy for so long, okay? So it's actually a rate. And then 30C describes how fast you can discharge this pack into the motor so that you can fly essentially. Um, and then there's other things too, but I'm trying to simplify it somewhat. 3S just speaks to the number of cells. So it could be a 4S or it could be a, a 5, which is kind of weird, or a 6S. And yes, there are 5S. Um, the leads will get bigger as you get more cells involved and or you have a higher C rating because that's the speed by which they discharge. I'm gonna trade you, please. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just lay this plane down so that I can show you how to load the battery. If you use a bigger pack, the 2200 is a good size. Uh, there should be no problems with using that. I kind of tied my Velcro strap into this weird loop because that helped to hold everything, but you don't have to do it that way. You can just tuck it in like this. This 2200 3S, it's about everything you can do to get it to fit, so the strap is sort of a, an afterthought, if you will on this one. So if you can't feed it all the way through, one trick you can do is you can just kind of set that over the top and then you'll get plenty of purchase on the Velcro or hook and loop, I should say. I don't even think it's technically Velcro. Velcro is a brand. So then you plug it in and you'll notice that it kind of moved the ailerons. Those are ailerons. And you want to kind of get this closed relatively quickly. And I had a piece of tape on here so that it wouldn't come off. Now, once you lay this down, watch, it's gonna dance two dances. That's one, that's two. That indicates that it's initiated in safe. Later on, when you get to more sophisticated aircraft, it's gonna dance once for AS or X only and twice for safe. The lights are restored to all four. That's gonna speak to the amount of percentage that's left in the battery. 100% flashing, that means somewhere between uh, 100% and 75% and then so on and so forth. So when you're down to flashing one light, that means you're between 25 and zero. So this is your high rate, low rate. So you can see the ailerons move more or less. So more is up on the top and less is on the bottom. That helps for beginners. This is your throttle hold or throttle cut. They're kind of used synonymously within aircraft and or heli. So there, that shuts off the throttle. I always talk about throttle cuts on. I say that out loud as a, a rule, as a habit. Then I'm in full expert mode, but there's also a bind button that acts as a panic button. So for a beginner, you'd be all the way down here. Now, if you press panic, the plane is going to even tighter be controlled by the flight controller and it will keep flying straight whatever direction it's going. So if you're about to hit something, you'll be limited on what you can do about it. So don't use panic if you can avoid it, just go into safe. So go into safe, practice going into safe, just stay in safe. When you're really ready, you can come out of safe. I recommend going all the way to expert. Don't use intermediate, in my opinion, I don't think it works. It just allows you to get into tough spots and then be limited on your outs. There's a big part of flying is that always having an out, always having a redundant system, okay? So my recommendation is fly in beginner mode or expert. Just skip the metal step. I don't feel like it serves any interest for new pilots. Horizon may not like that, too bad. Um, I'm here to serve you guys. Horizon is one of the many companies that we work with and they do a really good job, but I don't think intermediate really helps anybody. I think it just gets people in bad spots. Elevator up, down, rudder left, right. Roll left, roll right. You'll see in beginner mode, this is a mix on the ailerons to the rudder. And what that does is it helps coordinate the turn. So as the plane is flying forward, when you roll the plane, it also points the tail 
or points to nose so that it cuts into the turn. That's called a coordinated turn. I do that a lot when I'm flying anyway in expert mode, but this does it automatically to a certain extent. And you can mix that on programmable transmitters even when you're in expert mode. So throttle cuts off. The camera crew is gonna trade me positions for a minute. Do you want me to get up in the air yeah. first and no, just verify? No, just at least drive. Well, it's a new pack, so oh, let's okay. make sure everything works. That's fine. Okay, so about 50% throttle and nice roll. It's a little bit heavier, so you gotta go a little bit faster. I'm in beginner mode. Okay, so I'm in expert mode now. So one thing that we're gonna talk about later in this video is that we had an issue with a gimbal, which is the thing that I'm using on my left hand to control the rudder. See how it's moving? I'm doing that with my thumb. What was happening is it was uh, going all the way to one side versus all the way to the other. And uh, we resolved it. But at any rate, if you're curious to see what happened to us and how we tracked down the problem and how we resolved it, stay tuned. We'll have a very exhaustive look at that. We'll show you the maiden flights when it was actually doing it. And you can see the very distinct difference in flight characteristics. But that is a fluke from Flukeville. We have never had that happen with a Horizon plane before, and we probably never will again. Mm -hmm. But we wanna show you because then you can learn a little bit from that experience. If you were a new pilot and you had something like that happen, it would be one phone call to Horizon. You would say, hey, this is what's going on. What can you do for us? And they will make it right. They're one of the few hobby companies that actually follow up after the sale. It's very uncommon. If you have a great local hobby shop, they might do that. But even anymore, guess who's really doing it? Horizon. Okay, so we hear a plane. I'm gonna just do one more trick here. Let's just go up here so you can see the airplane. You see it up there, guys? Thousands of feet away, we're safe. Remember, yield to manned aircraft. I'm gonna land this plane. See how I'm going in the bowl, camera crew? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm just going in the bowl, just slowing down. Worst case scenario, you just land in the grass. Best case scenario, you land on the runway, okay? So now you're lined up. We have the sun in this perfect position. Isn't that so cool between the trees? It is really pretty. What a beautiful sunset. Am I taking off going that way? Thro um, throttle cut is on. Okay. Rates are high. Safe mode's on. Go. I want to take off that way. Why? You can take off and go up in the air. Okay. You want to go the other way? I do. <laughs> All right. Well, then I'll back taxi for you. This is called back taxiing. So when you taxi to the other end of the runway, we have no wind. You can see the windsock in the background. Thank you, John, for that. Grumpy John, he's one of our subscribers. Longtime subscribers, equal opportunity and fender. So here we go. All right, guys, we're going to trade camera crew. Camera okay. crew is going to film. She hates it when I put her on camera. And here is the transmitter, and here is the plane. How do you want to do this? I am filming. It's going to be bad. I apologize. It will be. It we're will going to be keep terrible. this short. Okay, well, here's my question before I go. How do I keep going straight down the runway? Because as soon as I throttle, I always veer one direction or well, the other. Well, you use this stick. This is your yaw control for the rudder. It also controls the steerable nose gear. Okay, so it's tied you know together. Which way I'm going. Just, okay. that's why I wanted you to take off so that if you, here's a trip. Here's a trick, guys. When you're trying to learn to fly, you want to have the plane pointed away from you and then you know, because your orientation stays the same when it's going away from you. When it oh. comes back at you, it rotates, but you get used to it. You lit I don't even literally think about it. I know it just you happens don't. in my brain. No, but when I started, it did. Right. Okay, okay. So, so here's the thing. If it points elevator. toward us, just give it more throttle and pull back on this stick, okay? Right, okay. All right, so here goes nothing. All right, full throttle, pull back the Whoop. stick. Keep okay. flying, <laughs> keep flying, get it all the way up there. Now, what you're gonna do is you're gonna use your yaw control. Okay, you can relax the throttle a little bit, about 50%, there you go, good job. Now, I would recommend rolling the plane so that it comes back toward us, that is a beautiful sunset. Okay, so just relax, don't freak out, you've got lots of time to respond, your many mistakes high. It's a lot less scary for us when I can just grab the controls when there's a concern, but since I'm filming, it complicates things. Trying to give you a shot of Megan and the sun <laughs> and the plane. 
Okay, Megan. So what you're going to do is you're going to relax and go in a circle. Okay, just keep your throttle under control. What are you going to go figure eight now? Do that. That's a good know. idea. I was trying to be like less than four miles away. Well, that's really helpful for filming reasons. I can't believe I didn't crash into the I just, house. I just don't want anybody to uh, <laughs> accuse us of you not actually flying because we've I'm, got lots of other gremlins that are flying for us. I'm pretty sure that they're pretty confident that the terrible flying is me. I don't think it really looks all that terrible, hon. I think it looks great. Okay, now I want you to try this, camera crew. Yep. Let your throttle out all the way. Up or down? Just turn toward us. Okay. Very gentle. You don't have to give it a hundred percent turn. There you go. Now all the way out of your throttle. Okay. Bring no it throttle. down the runway. Just gently. Don't overthink it. That's part of the problem when you're a new pilot is you tend to overthink everything. Yeah. And then you get confused. Okay. Now throttle and pull back on the elevator. Okay. More throttle. Just respond to Jeez. what you see. Okay. Okay, now what I want you to do is go in a huge circle from where you are now and just come kind of point back toward us. Relax. Point back toward us right now? There you go. Yep. Okay. I want you to fly over the bull and then land the plane. So guys, when you see this camera work, you're going to absolutely know that I am not piloting that aircraft. In fact, look, I'm not piloting the aircraft. Safe and my camera crew. Hey, pull up. Go up on top of the trees. Okay, relax. Now remember, you gotta fly out past the trees. Good job. Now turn. Keep your altitude up. Okay, now just relax. No throttle. Point Not it toward okay. us. Push down as hard as you can on the stick. Okay, all the way. Now back up! <laughs> See, she landed it. <laughs> it was terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I assumed you knew that you were going to like eventually. Okay, just stop for a minute. I okay. got to look at that thing. So <laughs> we're, we're going to switch reins again. Well, I guess I can take that too. Okay, so first things first, you did fly that technically. Throttle cuts on. Okay, but what did I do? You pointed into the ground. That's what you told me to do. Well, I didn't mean for you to keep pointing it into the <laughs> ground until it crashed, but I'm glad that you obeyed the instructions very clearly. Okay, so let's just see how this does. You didn't destroy it. Good job. So. I have to land it good at some point to practice. No, I know. <laughs> you see the, you see the front wheel, how it's yawed to the side. Which I want to like show the before. <laughs> well, that's because you went all the way full throttle into the ground. Actually, it was no throttle into the ground. So it's really nice slip right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to have a little. <laughs> okay. So it's obviously still attached. It's just that it's not going totally straight. So throttle cuts on. So what happened was when she hit the ground and that should be a test of robustness like we don't typically yeah. do on this channel unless we're running into trees, okay? Yes, I'm flying. So this just needs to be straightened out. And to be honest, you could probably just do it like this, but the correct way to do it would be to pull off the wing and make the adjustment on the control arm, mm. okay? So what camera crew was talking about during takeoff is that when she gives throttle, watch what happens to the plane, okay? It's going pretty straight now. Then you pull back, right? I'm not even in safe there, right? But you, you develop a certain level of instinct. You kind of know how to read what's happening with the plane. You know what input needs to be given when you get to being a better pilot. And that's part of becoming a better pilot is crashing hundreds of times. Oh, see, I'm well on my way. No, you're not. You've only <laughs> crashed like maybe six or seven times. You need to do hundreds and hundreds more. I know, but I've only flown like eight times. Well, you're doing pretty good then. And by the way, the heavier battery does make it slightly harder to fly. So if we were smarter, we would have done this with the lighter pack. So Horizon did a great job in picking the 1300 3S. It's a perfect platform for this plane. And by the way, I'm at like 50% throttle. So if you guys are thinking, lame, it's slow. Well, I don't think that every plane needs to go full speed all the time. I'm at 30% throttle, 30 to 40%. And uh, let's go in the bowl here. I'm gonna go behind us, you ready? Yep. Good job. 
So basically, if you wanna fly a plane like this and you wanna really enjoy the experience, the best thing you can do, get yourself a wide open area. This is hardly a wide open area. I mean, we feel like it's a wide open area because it's our area. But if you really want to fly, get a bigger area, go to a flying club, get some help from one of the veterans. If they refuse to help you or aren't interested, go to a different flying club. Don't go to a place where there's a bunch of old guys that don't want anything to do with SAFE, okay? SAFE is the wave of the future. It's the way people learn to fly these days. If they don't like it, too bad. So there are many, many, many old folks at the flying clubs that are annoyed that we have such an easy time learning because they had to build this thing out of sticks and it took them six months and they all crashed their first three. So I'd be bitter if I was them. <laughs> Look how easy this is, guys. And one of the hardest things to learn is altitude control, right? Yeah. So when you get to being a little bit more experienced and you have an ultra good flying plane like this, then it will make you look good as a pilot. I forget how scary it was to fly when it was when I was new. Yes. But when you're flying and you're new, it is quite intense. Even if you're flying a plane that you could crash and have virtually nil consequences, it's still quite intense. Now, when you get a plane that's like really amazing and like legitimately challenging to fly, and then you try to fly it as a new pilot, you're gonna crash it. I'm gonna give you a 99.9% .9 guarantee that you're going to crash. So just don't do that because you're gonna ruin your experience. We call them one and dones. You're gonna be so shocked by the negativity of the experience that you will literally quit. And that's one of the things that happens in RC aviation a lot. That's one of our main missions here on RC, on Brian Phillips RC, is to help prevent one and dones. One and dones being customers that buy an airplane that's way too advanced for what they're trying to do. And then they expect to go out and it's like, oh, I watch Brian do it. If he can do it, I can do it. Well, that may be true, but you have to put that in the context of I've been doing this six years, hundreds of planes, multiple transmitters, tens of thousands of dollars worth of batteries. I mean, it's just like all the different things that maybe 20 or 30 different guys have experienced in this same six year period, we've experienced together. And it's been very cool to do that, but it's also a very compressed, tight schedule of learning like on steroids. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a problem for me? because I am a bit of an obsessive compulsive personality? No, that's exactly the way I want it. But the thing is, not everybody's gonna have that experience. So if it takes you two years to get comfortable with your apprentice, that's maybe a little bit slow, and flying out of safe, and the next plane you wanna get is the uh, P-51 June Knight, 1.2 meter, tail dragger, warbird, then so be it. It's an amazing experience and every aspect of it is so much fun, guys. You're gonna, you're gonna get up in the morning and be driving to work and you're gonna think, look at that flag, it's dead calm. I need to like quit my job today. <laughs> I mean, that's literally what you're gonna be thinking. It's, it's, it's poisonously addictive, but in a wholesome, positive kind of way. And our world really does need more pilots. I mean, seriously, they're dying off. And uh, the, the bar has been set so high for pilots that uh, we're pretty much not replacing them. So that's another thing that we wanna help correct on this channel is get more people involved in aviation because aviation is just an amazing, immersive, wonderful experience. And we also need to drive down the overall cost of being involved in aviation so that it can be reached by more people. Did you know that there are only, uh, like, I think it's some stat, like less than 1% of the population of China is, is pilots. It's, uh, and it's way, way less than that, actually. It's, it's way more staggering. Really? Yeah, it's amazing. And so if you're, if you're in America right now, America, 
you are in one of the best places on the planet Earth to fly airplanes. Did you know that? Hmm. It is one of the best environments by which to fly airplanes. And also, the way the United States goes, generally the rest of the world goes in terms of aviation policy. And so if you're into aviation policy and directing the way that the world operates, you are in the place to be. Which, if you're in America, you're already in the richest, most capable economy in the history of time. So there's absolutely no excuse. If you want to fly, you need to get at it right now. Don't wait. You need to fly today. Don't wait until you're 75 years old to start a hobby that you love. Doesn't mean you have to break the bank every month. Although if you watch my channel, you're going to be very tempted to do it. <laughs> because we do fly some of the newest, latest and greatest. And we're going to try our very best to talk you into buying it because we love it so much. And that's how we fund our channel is by the support that you offer by buying through our links. You don't pay any extra. We just get a small commission from the manufacturers that we work with. Some are manufacturers, some are distributors, and then others are just one-off. Small companies, mom-pop shops. We love doing this, sharing this with the world. I think the world is a little bit bigger than 102,000 subscribers, but at the same time, we're growing and we wanna have you guys along for the ride. We are at three lights out of four, by the way. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Let's show the people. Look at this. You see that? Isn't that wow. just incredible? 2200 3S, you could probably fly so long that you get tired of it and you need to go to the bathroom or eat lunch. So what have we learned about this plane, camera crew? I know I've done lots of jabbering today. It's a really great plane. It's a, it's a great beginner plane. I, I'm actually torn. I'm torn between this and the Aero Scout. The Aero Scout. Yeah, seriously. <sighs> because I love them both so much. But I feel like this one just flies a little bit better. It's a little bit slower. The electronic speed control doesn't ramp up weirdly, but it does have a tractor prop, which means it's on the front and it pulls it forward. Whereas the Aero Scout is on the back, so it's more protected, less likely to break. So, okay. But look at how awesome it handles. I know. Plus the Aero Scout has bigger, more ugly tires, but they do work really nice in grass. A lot of people that are gonna be flying this plane are gonna be park flyers. So here's my opinion as a new, like someone who doesn't fly actually. You fly? Megan, you the, realize that you've flown RC more than like 99% of the women in this country. Well, I don't know about you that. You do realize that, right? Okay, Maybe but 96%. The Aero Scout is less intimidating to me because of, like you said, the prop, the gear. But this wing is held on by a rubber band. Like if you right. do, and plus, the Aero Scout does have tendencies to where if you make a rough landing, you'll break that servo that runs the rudder and steerable nose gear. This has 13 gram servos, way more robust, way more strong. I definitely like the look of this plane. And it looks better. more like a plane. Because it looks like a plane. Yeah. yeah, whereas the Aero Scout looks like a cartoony sort of plane. Right. But that's not a problem. I love the way the Aero Scout looks. I think it's fun. But it's not, it's not going to satisfy the scale enthusiasts right but a lot of people are going to see this and think oh it's just a lame high wing trainer and i'm like no it's not guys i have planes downstairs that cost you know by the time you're in almost a thousand dollars just the plane and i love flying this guys i have an appreciation for almost every aircraft we have even the crappy chinese ones that we get from banggood and I have a strong appreciation for flying a well done, well balanced. Beautiful, really, I think it's beautiful. But I like the looks of the Carbon Cub S2 maybe better, but I, I think this flies markedly better than that plane. 
Also the 1.5 meter, if you got a little bit bigger budget, you can get into the 1.5 meter and you're gonna have just as great of a flying experience, but it's just bigger. So if your eyes are bad, you may want the bigger apprentice. When you click on my link, they both come up. It's like a red and white one instead of a blue and white one. It's just a little bit bigger. And you may not realize, but a 1.5 compared to a 1.2, it's darn near twice the size. Right, wouldn't you say? It's more like maybe 45%. Mm -hmm. And don't just talk about, you know, don't think of a line. Think of every aspect of right. the plane is bigger. The fuse is bigger. The fuse the tail is, is bigger. bigger. It's wider. Yeah. It's thicker. Yeah. It's heavier. That also means the wing loading is exceptional. I mean, guys, we're doing one wheel touch and goes. I'm not even hardly thinking about it. I'm sitting here trying to sell you other planes. What's not to love about this thing? And it'll do aerobatics if you want to. You just got to stay on the throttle. My son will fly this for sure. That's actually one of his favorite planes to fly. He's actually really been into the Aero Scout actually lately. Mm -hmm. But that's a newer one for us. We, we had to wait for the latest and greatest release, the re-release of the Aero Scout because of some shipping conditions that had come up because of Corona or COVID-19. Um, when we first started working with Horizon, we were supposed to review it almost right away. It was supposed to be like the first plane we did. And we were super excited because it was one that was on our short list of beginner planes that we just couldn't resist. We early released the Mini Apprentice, or excuse me, not the Mini, it, it was the Mini Aero Scout. Yep. And just, I was never really into it. I never thought it was the one of the best um, choices because it didn't have safe and a variety of other factors. It was a good plane for its own reasons, but I just didn't really care for it compared to anything else. The full-size 1.1 meter Apprentice, on the other hand, excuse me, Aero Scout, was awesome. Yeah. And I think he's flown a lot on the simulator over the winter. He has in our son. Our son. Yep, he's 11. And our, um, he's flown some of the smaller, like, Banggood ones, which is just not the same. So I feel like the Aero Scout was the first one that he really could take ownership, and he felt like... This is he my He was confident, like, putting the battery in, mm -hmm. getting things set up, getting the radio set up. Like, By the way, we're down to one light, but gracious. not flashing. No. Guys, we're trying to give you a no BS review, it's too. Be dark before you're done. I know. But hold on. We were talking about Andrew. So the yeah. other thing is Andrew has this predisposition to wanting to have, you know, things figured out before he does something. Yep. He has to be good at it. I'm like, Andrew, you're not going to be good. You're not going to be a good pilot before you're a good pilot. You have to spend the time. You have to put in the time. You have to crash. You have to have the frustration that goes with it. It's part of learning. Yep. And the school of hard knocks is the best and really honestly the only way, in my opinion. You can do everything on a simulator, but if you ask me, Real Flight 9.5 is one of the best ways. We have a link to it below, but it's quite expensive. I mean, it's almost as much as this plane ready to fly. You see that nose gear? I think we loosened up. Mm, yeah, so we have to take the cow in. off and there is a Phillips screw that needs to be tightened, which will then bite onto the shaft of the steerable nose gear. It still kind of moves, but I can tell it's adversely yawing the plane a little bit here. So I don't know, guys. I almost wonder if we should show them fixing that real quick in case they run into a same situation where they Maybe go. so my lighting yeah. is going to get okay. pretty sketchy. So let's land, that. guys. We've seen this thing do everything that it does pretty much in the almost 45 minutes of flying, right? Yeah. And I've loved every minute of flying this plane. Okay? So you see it still kind of turns, but not really. That's because there is a, a collar that goes around the shaft that spins that wheel, and there's a screw, a set screw that goes in and tightens and it bites, and that's how it moves. So if that comes loose a little bit, like in a landing that's really rough, it may spin free. And so we'll show you how to fix that right now. We'll come right back inside. All right, so we just flew forever, and I don't even know how long it was, but it was forever. It's like 45 minutes. Yeah, so throttle cuts on, and we've tested it before we hold. See this, how it's just loose? There's a screw right there that just needs to be tightened. Okay, so after that rough landing by the camera crew, we just need to tighten that screw. It's right there. Oh, yep, I see. Okay, so there's two ways to do that. You can either remove this cowl, 
there's uh, one, two, three screws that need to come off and you unfortunately would have to take the prop off. So I'm gonna try another trick that might work great. And that is to reach in through this vent and see if I can reach it. Oh, it's really close. I'm gonna get the plane stand so that it's easier. The plane stand is something that we have linked in our videos, um, video descriptions. You don't need to have an, I call it an RC stand because you don't have to use it for planes. Uh, but this thing, thanks Tom sent this, not the same Tom I was talking about earlier, but another Tom, one of our subscribers. You don't have to have a plane stand, but if you're gonna do this a lot and you're an old guy like me and your back gets sore, it is really handy. Yeah. Okay, so just looking through here, do you see the screwdriver does reach? See this? So all I gotta do is turn this to where it's straight without giving any input to the rudder control and then just torque it down. So now that's set. So now we'll just show the people real quick. As I yaw the aircraft, it moves. And then of course, it's got a little bit of strength to it. Okay, so it's not gonna immediately come loose. If you had another style Chinese screwdriver, these are ones that we get a million times in these little airplanes we review. Yeah, even that reaches, that's actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's a pretty good fit right there. That's a better one, it bites better. Mm. So just a Phillips, uh, standard sized precision screwdriver should be no problem. And let's go out and do some more flight and just uh, wrap this up outside, okay? All right, so I took my visor off because I know some of you guys really get concerned about my visor. They really like it. That's right. I had one guy who really liked it. <laughs> like he wanted to take me out for dinner too. But um, anyway, uh, visors are a great way to hold your sunglasses while you're flying. I'm not trying to teach you to use visors. But if you wanna be really cool like me, you're gonna get yourself a visor and you're gonna put your sunglasses in it because then they'll be on your head really good. And when it goes from cloudy to very sunny, you can quickly throw those on. Yeah. Well, it's not just about being totally cool like Brian Phillips RC. Right. It's all about facilitating flying, okay? There's certain times where you wanna be able to see good, but then have the sun blocked from directly above you too. Yep. And by the way, we do a lot of filming at twilight because of the nature of my day job and I get kept at work late and there are times when I get home and it's still sunny and the sun is about there. And then there's other times when I get home and the sun is like on the other side of the planet. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so it just depends on uh, what our customer demands are for my day job. I work on industrial scales for a living and I do a lot of technical things as a result. I write software for our company, as well as doing integration to network environments. But then I also do a lot of what I would qualify as monkey work, and that would be checking scales with dead weight. I do a lot of it. So I put test weights onto the scale and make sure that the scale reads the correct weight, and if it doesn't, then I fix it. And so I do a lot of technical stuff as part of my career. And I've always been into, I've always been into electronics, stereos, um, you know, obviously radio controlled stuff, cars. When I was a kid, I had an RC10, which was a Horizon product, I believe. Oh, really? Yeah, I think so. And uh, I've just always been into this stuff. I did, I, I did trains. I used to have this big board on my wall. I had this weird room in, the house that I grew up at, on the south side of Des Moines. And we used to, it was a full sheet of plywood that had a little shelf mounted to the wall and you could fold it down, it was hinged. So we had a big um, figure eight track and we would fly the, or we would not fly the, we would uh, drive the trains around on there. It was super fun. I just had all sorts of fun stuff. Um, as a kid, my dad flew one gas plane, an eaglet made by SIG. I think they still probably make and sell that plane today out of Montezuma, Iowa, which is about 45 minutes from our house here. We had a subscriber come and visit us just the other day. And the reason they ended up close was because they were going to SIG. So that was fun. If you guys are watching Chad and Blake, two of our subscribers, they came out in the RV, spent the night. We made some steak dinner for them. It was really, it was fun, we, in, we took them out into the corn that doesn't belong to us. Neighbors, if you're watching, please forgive us. Because it's something else when you drive by corn and you're like, oh, that doesn't look too tall. And then you're like, hold on, let's fly over here and show them. 
this corn is probably 14 feet tall right now. <laughs> and it'll probably be 15 or 16 feet tall when it's gone to full maturity. I think it's probably about done getting tall. But if you go in there, you'll get lost. Yeah, it's... And not like corn maze lost, like it's <laughs> okay. actually lost. lost. Like lost. kids get lost in there. Yeah. It's like very scary when that happens. So if you're a kid, don't get lost in the corn. And if you're a parent and you want to scare your kids out of doing that, just have them watch the children of the corn. <laughs> I was just going to say, don't do that. <laughs> but anyway, enough about us. Uh, the reason you're on this channel is not to hear our story. It's to learn about this aircraft, learn whether it's worth buying. Oh, and full disclosure, we did have a bit of an issue with this plane, something that's not customary on a Horizon product. We almost never have real problems. We just have problems that I caused by running into trees and things of the sort. But no, in this case, we had a bit of a, uh, an issue on our transmitter that came with it, and we were able to resolve it. So if you really want to see what we did to resolve it, just stay tuned. Uh, it's something that the RC sailors would not do on their channel. Um, they would do more of an entertainment-based, you know, hey, look, this one's cheap or whatever. We want to give you a more in-depth look at these products. Not to take anything away from the RC sailors. They're a great family, and... Nate and Abby do a great job, and we're obviously very jealous of their success, and we're trying to get it ourselves. <laughs> but the thing is, we do things very different on this channel, and I think that there's definitely room for the both of us in the world. So if you are a crossover customer, which there is a lot of it, we welcome you to Brian Phillips RC. I make lots of jabs at the RC sailors, mostly because our videos are so long, if they stuck around and watched, it would help our analytics by doubling <laughs> the watch time. That's a hilarious joke, because that means that only one person would have watched the whole video. Thank you, John. I don't even think John watches our whole videos. Probably not. He has to go feed the pigs. He does. He's got some cute black pigs. We were jokingly talking about having him send a couple of pigs. The problem is I like bacon too much. So they wouldn't last long around yeah. here. And pigs are freaking cute. If you've never seen pigs, they're like puppies. And they have about the intelligence of a, of a dog. And they are so cute when they're little. So I don't know. I would have to hire somebody to make them into bacon for me. God makes the bacon. We just cut it up. <laughs> That's what that goes. Yeah. So, have we offended everybody yet? Uh, I think you're getting pretty close. Okay, good. The RC Sailors, check. Bacon, bacon haters, check. Old people, <laughs> that takes, check. Yes, old people, check. <laughs> Horizon for showing the screw up they made, check. Guys, we love Horizon. It's one of our favorite products and we work a lot with them. So, we don't want to take anything away from the success Horizon has enjoyed. Not the least of which is because of Brian Phillips RC, of course. Well, because they were just a real rinky dink company before they started working with us. Well, <laughs> but I think that says something too. Like, we've done tons of these and we've never had that kind of an issue. Yeah. Like, so we're calling it a fluke, but at the same yeah. time, you come to this channel to it learn. Happens. And to learn how to deal with flukes is part of what we bring to the table. And we're willing to show them and they're willing to let us. That says a lot about the companies we work with. Now, we also review Dynams, and uh, Dynams are like a frustrating, um, what, are they, what do they call it, a dumpster fire? <laughs> That's the way the builds go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, me and Megan, by the time we're done filming those, we just wanna be away from each other and yeah. most Dynam planes. If we weren't having a fight before the Dynam plane. We were after. <laughs> we are after. <laughs> but the thing that's good about Dynam planes is when you're all done, sometimes they fly good. The thing that's really cool about Horizon planes is they pretty much always fly good. Yep. I mean, there's a very few minority of planes. There's one VTOL I can think of that was inferior to its Chinese competitor. And pretty much everything else is the best flying within its peer group. That's not like this is up against, you know, like a, a free wing F-14 that my camera crew promised me when we moved to the country. Or anything like that. The one that I don't have yet, even though I've had hundreds of other planes. Freewing. You remember that listening. one? Send us a plane. That would be Motion, by the way. Motion has already said no. They don't trust us to say what they want us to, I don't think. Which is very weird. I thought they were pretty reputable. 
but they're a little bit concerned we might be too honest, I think. Well, for the And record, that's a fair concern because we will be. The camera crew has never said that you can't have a free wing of 14. Yeah, well. We've just been a tiny bit busy. Oh, is that what's happened? So guys, I don't know like how much longer we can keep flying this. We're about ready to run out of light, but we're still on one green light. We've showed you a repair of the nose gear. We've showed you how to break the nose gear. We've showed you how to fly the airplane. We've showed you how to unbox the plane, bind it, set it up. We've actually, we'll show you how to bind it in the repairs part of the video, which is later. We'll show you how to do some diagnostic work. We'll show you how to identify the control surfaces, how to fly the plane for fun. We'll show you how to take it apart a little bit so that you can learn what's going on inside of your transmitter. We're gonna show you a lot. So if you're still watching this video now, gold star for you, which basically means a whole lot of nothing, but still the gold star may come up in the comments. All you have to do is ask and I will grant you a gold star. Occasionally we have viewers that have long time history and they will ask for a gold star and I will grant the gold star. And I love to make our viewers happy. Even if that means showing some crashes from time to time, because I know you guys love watching me crash. Oh, I crashed too, hon. Remember? When I did that stupid, I was in oh, intermediate and I thought I was in- Accidental touch and go. Yeah. And yeah, that was about as rough as mine. Yeah, unscheduled landing. Yeah. God, I can't believe, oh, oh, I have no battery power. Meaning I have no light but I have plenty of power, I can tell. So I'm gonna just go ahead and come around here and try you to have land. no light at all? No light, so we're landing. Here we go, guys. Which is kind of funny because I think we're more likely to have actually run out of power. Oh, no, we oh, do. Went back to one. I, 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 had, I do have one. Okay, I can't end on that crappy landing. Beautiful roll. Going out a distance. Slipping, that means using the rudder and ailerons to bring it in at an angle, and then down you go. What a beautiful rollout. Guys, I love this plane. There's almost nothing I can say bad about it other than the fact that we did have a bit of an issue on one of the gimbals. We identified it, we fixed it. We are uniquely positioned to fix this type of thing. You may not be. If you would happen to get a weird situation like that come up, Horizon will take care of it, and they do. They really do. I remember there was a time, and this is years ago, this is well before I worked with Horizon um, to do reviews. And this was like, I think it was a Sport Cub S UMX. It might've been my first plane. And I burned through seven motors on that plane. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like once a week because I was flying 500 milliamp 1S packs. And that's a lot, by the way, it comes with 100 milliamp or 120 milliamp pack. By the way, great plane to learn. We have videos, just look in our playlist and you can find it and watch it and learn lots about it. I've got three of them. Um, I was burning through motors and I think I called them on maybe the first or second one. And these guys shipped me apart and I had it maybe the next day. And I was able to fly that weekend and it was just amazing. The customer service at Horizon is second to none. So just take it worth a grain of salt when we show that occasionally things don't go right. This is RC. It is a hobby grade thing. They're making hundreds of thousands of units and they have to hold down the cost. If they went through every single item, which there's hundreds on a plane that could cause a failure, they'd probably quadruple the cost. But Horizon is one of the few that has good quality assurance. So we aren't even on a dead battery. If this was flashing, in fact, we can put it on the XBC battery checker. We didn't do that before, did we? We did not. Throttle cuts on, sorry guys. The XBC battery checker never actually made an appearance for the 1300 milliamp, but we can actually probably go ahead and do that now if you want. Let's just go ahead and unplug this because it's ridiculously long video already. Yes. Okay, so with a smart battery, Gen 2 in particular, you've only got this. The XBC battery checker is like a $40 thing. It is an awesome tool. You can test servos with it, which is super, super nice. It's got a color screen and it's got a couple of buttons. You do have to get that all the way inserted so that the smart lead goes in. We have 9% left on that. 3.7 volts is probably not a terrible ending point. <laughs> Excuse me. 3.8 would be better because it's already at storage voltage. And if you're just new to this hobby and you wanna know what storage voltage is, you're probably gonna need to stick around longer because we talk about things like this. Storage voltage is 3.8 volts. Um, fully charged is, is 4.2. Can you please help you? 
hold the plane uh, right there by the wing roots. Okay, good job. Okay, so the IC3 connector that I was just unplugging, they make a pretty good purchase when you're plugging them in. Yes. So the moral of the story is the Aero Scout is a great beginner plane and the Carbon Cub S2 is a great beginner plane. But I still firmly believe that the Apprentice S, which is this 1.2 meter, it's formerly the Mini, this has been upgraded with the new Air 631. So it's got the latest and greatest technology with the exception of the Avian ESC, because then you could do thrust reverse. You're not gonna want thrust reverse on this plane, believe me, this plane is amazing. You should definitely seriously consider it if you are new to the game and you wanna fly. This is a very good middle ground. The, the uh, Sport Cub SUMX is a great choice if you don't have as much room to work with. It is sub 250 grams, which means you don't need any pesky uh, authorization from the FAA, which is very easy to get and it costs $5 for three years. So it's like practically nothing, um, but you don't need that at all for that plane. This plane is slightly bigger. It's gonna be better in wind. And you could probably fly this up to like seven or eight miles an hour wind, maybe 10 if you're a little bit more skilled. The more wind, the more skill you're gonna need. Safe is gonna help keep you flying. If you don't put your control horns at the inside like we did, you can put them in the outside. It'll be even easier to fly for both the elevator and rudder. <clears throat> Safe is gonna be a little bit more effective in there too. We never saw oscillation on this plane, which would look something like this at full speed. We never saw oscillation on yaw, roll, or pitch. So as far as I'm concerned, that's no big deal. Um, we did leave the ailerons at the stock configuration, but we had to do a little bit of straightening there. That's normal, not a big deal. We show it in our unbox, build, and radio setup. So without further ado, what's coming next is the unbox, build, and radio setup. And in that part of the video, we'll show you all the exhaustive setup. We're gonna go through lots of information, like talking about the shape of the wing and the dihedral and the prop and all sorts of different things. And at the end of all that, there's gonna be some help for how did we find out what was wrong with the transmitter? How do we do the troubleshooting? And then how do we arrive at the ultimate conclusion, which was a fixed transmitter rather than just getting a different transmitter, which we could have also done. And it would have been equally as successful. We wanted to repair it so that we could learn some things. So if you wanna learn what we learned, you can watch that. Also, Horizon Hobby, great plane. Good job, guys. We love this plane. It's definitely something to get excited about if you are a new pilot. If you're an experienced pilot, this plane is probably already been done by you. And if it hasn't, and you just want something that you can throw in your, your truck and just have an everyday plane, it would be a great plane for that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. more importantly, it'd be a great plane to take out, have the grandkids play with or the kids play with. Um, or if you've got somebody you're mentoring or whatever, it'd be a great choice for that because it's inexpensive. The wing is not so stiff that it won't you know, break off. Um, and just slide out of the way if you have a, a bad accident. And if it does break, it's nothing that hot glue can't fix or foam safe, uh, CA and some kicker, which we have links to, mucilage, which we also have links to, would be great. Foam to foam is another glue. You can glue it together, put a piece of packing tape on there and you are done. Packing tape on both sides on thin stuff like this. On a wing like this, if it literally breaks, you can glue the thing together, use a couple of bamboo skewers or a couple of toothpicks to reinforce it, put a little tape on there, you're done. We do show those repairs quite frequently on the videos that we produce. In fact, we just did on the 80 millimeter F-16 the other day, we had a little damage and we showed the repair. Or did we show that repair? I don't know if we did. I don't think we, we showed that foam this. repair, we but we have it showed it before. On, yeah. If your transmitter makes this noise, that's an inactivity warning. I moved a stick and it woke up, okay? So I'm gonna let the camera crew hold that. In conclusion, this plane is awesome. Buy it from the links below. You'll help support our channel with a small commission that comes from Horizon, not you. You pay the same price or sale price or coupon code price or whatever deal you've got going RC. Um, I think there's the RC bonus and all those different things. You can take full advantage of all that stuff. The only thing that happens is that they know that you watched our video, followed the link and then bought that way. That's how we get reimbursed for some of our time and energy. And obviously we put a lot of it into it. If you haven't figured that out yet, we've been doing this for six years and we do a lot of it, you know, a lot, lot of it. Go look at our videos. We have thousands of them. 
So we leave them up so that you guys can follow our journey from square one through. We got a couple of subscribers that are doing that right now, which is great. We love that because we put a lot of energy into the videos early on and we sucked at it compared to what we do now. <laughs> we're a lot better at filming. We're a lot better at audio quality. We're a lot better at flying. We're a lot better at bringing better quality products and trying to kind of reach our mission, which is to get more people flying, keep them flying and help them spend their money wisely on the best stuff that's coming out right now. And yes, there is tons more coming. So if you haven't already, give us a like. It helps offset our big punishment on the algorithm from YouTube because we have such long videos, have lots of detail, and you will be helping us in that way. Click the bell for notifications. If you're not already subscribed, subscribe, of course. You can look down below, we got a Patreon. We also have a PayPal if you like one-time gifts instead of multiple you know, recurring gifts, which is what Patreon does. But the biggest thing I think you should do is if you love this plane, just buy it. It's a great plane. Buy it in the ready to fly. If you have nothing, you can open it. The only thing you're going to have to have is a wall outlet uh, that's got a USB A input, or mm -hmm. you're going to use your laptop or your cell phone charger, unplug the cable that came with your phone and stick that in instead or your tablet. That's the only thing you need. It literally comes with the batteries for the transmitter otherwise. So guys, stay tuned. We're going to jump right into the unbox next. Thanks for watching. YouTube, it's Brian Phillips. We have something new and exciting. We've done this one before though, so don't get too excited. This is the Hobby Zone Apprentice 1.2 meter. And it is an awesome first plane if you're considering a first plane. It's also a good plane for anybody who wants to fly. It has safe, it has all the goodies you need. You can get this in ready to fly or you can get it in bind and fly basic if you've already got batteries and transmitter. This is the ready to fly. The ready to fly is great for somebody that has nothing yet. Obviously we have stuff, but we wanna show you how this comes out. Oh yeah. This is a 1.2 meter plane, so it's a great size. So if you're just getting into the game, this is a great way to get started. It features smart technology, which is really cool. And that's a spectrum thing, which is under the umbrella of Horizon Hobby. And this is the sort of plane that you can get as your first or second, or honestly, this would be a legitimate first time plane if you wanted to get this. The Sport Cub SUMX is a great first plane. It's a little bit cheaper if you don't want to spend this kind of money. And uh, the next step up from this, I would call the Carbon S2, the Carbon Cub S2, which is the gold and silver version. And that you can also get in ready to fly. But then the Aero Scout we recently reviewed is another great first plane. They come equipped with safe. And it's the same technology. This is a four channel plane. So you've got ailerons on the wing that rolls the plane. Then you've got an elevator and a rudder. And then of course you've got the throttle. So throttle, elevator, rudder, ailerons. And then there's some controls for safe. So that's what it looks like in the box. It's pretty easy to open the thing up. It just slides right out, which is nice. Some of these planes have a bunch of pieces you have to cut apart. And this thing should go together. It's got rubber band on top wing, which is nice. So if you have a rough landing, the wing can just kind of shift out of the way. Similar to the old gliders we used to get when we were kids. And uh, this thing comes literally with everything you need up to and including the double A's. The cheap Chinese versions don't come with the double A's. Not that it really is a huge factor for us because double A's aren't all that expensive. It is very nice to know that you're gonna get literally everything you need. I mean, it comes with the charger, it comes with the manuals, obviously, it comes with the plane, it comes with the LiPo. This is a 1300 3S Gen 1 Smart LiPo. It's 3S, that means that there's three cells in series. That's what S stands for, series, not cells. Um, and then, of course, this is shows the max charge rate of 3C, which would be three times 1.3 amps. Gives you your charge rate of 3.9 amps. Now, there's gonna be a charger included in this, but we'll show uh, an upgraded charger as well, so you can get an idea for what you need or what you'd like to have. If you get this plane, you'll get hooked, which is a good thing. 
And when you're hooked, you're gonna want more planes, which is another good thing. But just keep in mind, if you intend to buy one plane and use one battery, 1300 is gonna be somewhat limiting. It's gonna be good for this plane. And I think, what's the other kind of new, I think you can run a 1300 in the uh, Aero Scout 1.1. Oh, okay. So if you're curious about those planes, we have all sorts of videos on the channel, so it might actually be kind of hard to find, but we just reviewed it recently. But if you aren't familiar with the channel, there's playlists for every single plane we reviewed. And sometimes we have actually reviewed the re-releases. This is a re-release. And so the reason it was re-released is that the receiver became unavailable a while back. And so Horizon has been working their way through updating to put the new technology into the planes as they have been re-releasing them, which is really nice because some of you guys um, expressed some significant disappointment that certain planes had been discontinued. Well, they weren't ever discontinued. They ran out of receivers. And this is, I don't know if that's partly due to the coronavirus issues, the chip shortages and things like this, but let's just call it what it is. They, they didn't have them. So now they do, they have this new upgraded I believe this one has a 631 in it. Let's look real quick. This is the fuselage and uh, of course the body of the plane and the steerable nose wheel, big battery tray on the bottom. Okay, it's got the warning, bind plug. This is an IC3 connector, IC3 connector. This is a balance lead, I didn't mention that earlier. But on the smart batteries, they balance themselves all the time. The Gen 2 are so good at balancing themselves that they don't even have this battery this lead right here. This is called a balance lead. So this is the top. That's one cell right there. This is one cell right here. And then this is another cell right here. And they're in series. And this is the series discharge lead. And then this is the smart lead. This is where data gets transferred through this pin that straddles between these two. Okay. And then that goes into the electronic speed control and also into the receiver. In this case, this is an Air 631. So it's also got a push button on there that you can use to bind. So if you've lost your bind plug, you can do it without a bind plug. But in this case, it's a lot easier to use the bind plug because it's down here. Not 100% sure if this one comes with the bind plug, but you can always press that button. The uh, big drawback for doing that is that you have to have the wing kind of loose still. So typically by the time we're binding, we have the wing on. Okay, so what else comes in the package? Obviously we have a transmitter and I am going to purposefully go over details that many of you watching this may already know. It's not to bore you, it's because this channel is all about helping to get people up to speed and not the least of which is going over terminology. Like for instance, this is a transmitter, also known as a radio system between this and that thing in there, that's the receiver. If you're just getting back into flying radio controlled airplanes, you're familiar with transmitters, that's not a big deal. And you're familiar with receivers, but you're like, Brian, where's the crystals? Well, the crystals don't exist anymore. This is a 2.4 gigahertz um, transmission protocol, and it's called DSMX. And there's been DSM, DSM2, and then DSMX is where we are now. DSMX is a spread spectrum technology, and I'm not gonna go into all the marketing logo or lingo, but basically what that means is that within the spectrum of allowable use that this transmitter and receiver operate within, it will help to frequency hop as there's ch changes in conditions. And it won't hop into somebody else's channel. So back in the day, um, there was some very, very evil people that would take CB radios and they would go and crash radio controlled airplanes by holding down the, the transmit. Yes, this did happen, camera crew. And uh, luckily Why? most of those people have died because they were struck by lightning. <laughs> so anyway, hopefully, if you remember doing that, don't tell me in the comments, you're in trouble. <laughs> so anyway, um, and plus that, you know, if you did that, that will be aging you big time. So here on Brian Phillips RC, we like to cover all the details, all the glorious, many, many details that most people just overlook. So this is a charger, I believe, and I'm going from memory because I've opened a few of these boxes. You may have noticed that there's an airplane behind us on the floor. That's a Carbon Z-Cub SS, and that is a safe equipped model. 
And then if you look over here, we've got the Boeing 737 MAX 9, which is from XPR. That's a Chinese plane. It's very challenging to fly, hard to put together and lots of problems. And yet we still got through it. <laughs> we do it all on this channel, guys. So this is what we call the S120. Yes, it's got protective films. This is where you plug in your battery. On a Gen 1 pack, you do have to plug in the bounce lead and the discharge lead. And then you use a USB-C cable that goes into there. Yes, that is provided, USB-A to USB-C, if you're not familiar. Many of you guys in the hobby are going to tend, guys and gals in the hobby, are gonna tend to be uh, technologically uh, interested, let's just say. I'm not gonna say everybody's gonna be advanced, but most people that fly radio controlled stuff are gonna be into technology to a degree or another. So here's your USB-C. You notice that it's ambidextrous. You can plug it in either way. This is USB-A and you cannot, okay? So the way this works is you provide, which is ironic. I've always thought this to be quite ironic. They provide the double A's, but they don't provide the wall plug because yeah. everybody has an outlet to plug it into anymore. And I, I kind of hate that, but it is what it is. So we're gonna turn on one of these smart chargers. This is, this is a proper smart charger. When you get to the point where you've got, you know, a few batteries sitting here, which by the way, whoops, by the way, this is the same battery that came with that airplane, okay? So you notice it has a balance lead and it has a discharge lead. So this is a Gen 1 pack. A Gen 2 pack is gonna look more like this. It's gonna have a little bit different print on it. It's a little bit more orangey and a little bit less light orange. And there's no balance lead. So they both have chips in them that actually balance the cells. And you're like, Brian, why do you keep talking about balancing? You know, what is this about acrobats? No. Balancing means that the cells stay at even charge levels to one another. That is one of the primary safety features and efficiency features of a LiPo. A lithium polymer battery has individual cells and they will discharge extremely fast. And we only operate from 4.2 volts down to about, let's call it like 2.7, 2.6 volts, and then it drops off like a rock, okay? So if you were to chart the output, it goes something like this, down, okay? And the reason that it's so important to keep them balanced is because when you over discharge a LiPo or overcharge a LiPo, then you can create a dangerous condition in the chemistry of each of those cells and they can actually catch fire. So you have to be very careful. Now, I'm not saying that to scare anybody. There's nothing to be scared of here. Just use a hard surface. If you're in any doubt, if you ever have a cell that gets puffy or gets pierced, First of all, you're gonna know because it's gonna start steaming smoke and then catching on fire probably. But generally speaking, these lipos are, you know, that's the most dangerous part of the hobby. So respect them, be careful, but you don't need to be afraid of them. Okay, so I'm gonna use the provided charger to show you how this works. So plug it into a USB port and then a light comes on. This is one that's done. This is how hard it is to charge a battery nowadays. Here's a Gen 2 pack. Just to give you an idea, this is four cell, 2200, so it's a little bit bigger. This is 1300, that speaks to each of the individual cells. And then this is 4S, which speaks to the fact that there's four cells in series. And this is three cells. This is how hard it is. Okay, it's charging. Here's the brand new pack, guys. The reason I'm showing you this in this order is because when you get your very own, you're gonna do all these steps in probably the exact same order you're just gonna talk a lot less. <laughs> you might look a little weird if you do. So plug this in, nothing happens. And then you plug in the balance lead. And you can plug them in either way. Now it goes to some different light conditions. The light conditions are explained in the manual. And you can see it talks about the input and the output limitations. Now, first of all, I wanna talk about this for just a quick second. There is a mechanism by which to, believe it or not, update the firmware on this, and it is separate. So don't worry about it for what you're doing. If you're getting this as a bind and fly, just charge it. When you're ready to make that jump, which is gonna be on like plane number two, then you're gonna to wanna to get into something like this, or something like this, or something like this. They're, they're expensive. So this thing is like a couple, well, it's like 250 bucks, I think. 
So you're not gonna just go buy one of these because you got one plane, typically. If you wanna buy one, follow our links, you'll help support our channels. We're affiliates with these people. We work with other companies too, other competitive companies. And we're not afraid to tell you guys about that because we just love the hobby and we love airplanes. So you can see this one's done. There's also lots of good information that's shared here, except that you can see the internal resistance and then you can see the per cell voltages, okay? So we'll just unplug that since it's done. I was just showing you how easy it is to charge that. So now this battery here was charged just a few days ago, so it's probably already charged, but I'm gonna show you that you can actually charge it without the balance lead if you use the right type of charger. So you plug it in, it says insert balance lead. I'm gonna press play and I'm gonna scroll down to start. Whoops. And then I'm gonna continue without balancing. And then interestingly enough, it's got all the cell voltages. It's only three cells. See, 4.15, 4.15, 4.0, okay. So that's pretty cool. So basically, smart technology is built into the battery that you're getting, and it's built into the receiver, but in this case, it doesn't have a smart ESC. The electronic speed control, ESC, is what runs the brushless motor that sits behind this cowl here, okay? So if you give them a shot, in there, you can kind of see the side of the motor, it's black. You're not gonna be able to see it. You'd have to get right up in there. Can you see it? No, still can't see it. Angle's not gonna work. Okay. Oh, right there you can see it. From that side? Yeah, from this side you might be able to get it. Or from in that. Yeah, you can see it from See there. it? Yeah. That's a brushless motor. So there's a bell housing that's on the outside and it's got magnets that are glued into the edges here. Okay, and then inside here, there's coils and there's different sets of coils. And as they're energized, it spins the bell housing and there's a shaft that comes off the end to which the prop is adapted, okay? So um, think of it like an AC motor. We energize one coil and it moves and then you energize the next coil and it moves and you energize the next coil and it moves and so on and so forth. And so as it's controlled through the electronic speed controller, the output does whatever it's supposed to do. What's cool about an electronic speed controller over say a brushed motor with a brushed speed control. Oh my goodness, they're crop dusting across the street. We cool. must look. Okay. Okay, so we just told you a few minutes ago that we're obsessed with airplanes and we weren't just making it up. There's an airplane there too, what is going on? So this guy, He's crop dusting and we have that plane downstairs, which is so cool. He'll probably be crop dusting the field across the street here in a few minutes. Yeah, probably. Listen, he's close. He's 50 acres away right now. That is so cool. And by the way, so for the record, they fly directly over our house. Yep. That's why I'm so weird. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna continue the video, sorry. Okay, sorry, squirrels. So, just so you guys know what we're all about on this channel is teaching you how to get up to speed with this. You don't need to be an expert to fly this thing. My wife flies them and she's not an expert. She just listens to me ramble on <laughs> Definitely endlessly. Definitely not. So anyway, uh, the other thing that goes on inside of a plane, of course, is the servos. Uh, servos are little brushed motors in this case that are driven by a receiver. The receiver uses pulse width modulation to locate this little lever that comes off of here. It's called a control horn. The control horn moves a linkage that goes out to a control surface. We're gonna attach those later. And this one's for the rudder because it's attached also to the steerable nose gear. And then this one is attached to the elevator. So we're gonna hook that up shortly. These little pegs that come out are gonna hold the wing on. So if you're new to the hobby, what we do here on Brian Phillips RC is we take you through step-by-step -step in a long format. That's why this video is so long. So if you're looking for a short entertaining clip, you probably came to the wrong place, but hopefully we'll keep you from falling asleep too many times. Although if you do fall asleep, you'll probably have some, you know, like bit of information that you pick up. Subliminally. Subliminally. Yeah. So do all your sleeping in front of my videos. Mm -hmm. Just run them 24 seven, 365 days a week. So. All right, this is the wing. Looks pretty simple. It's got some dihedral in it. Why do we have dihedral? The dihedral, that's what this is, where it goes uphill a little bit on either side. And then these are ailerons driven by a servo. This is gonna give us some support in the middle. 
So that's probably made of fiberglass. I can't tell if it's wood or if it's fiberglass. It doesn't really matter, but just so you guys know, there is such a thing. Also, the aileron plugs are right here so that you understand the channels on the transmitter and receiver are not necessarily going to only control one servo. In this case, the aileron channel controls two servos on the same channel because when this one moves, this one is mounted so that it moves opposite, which is sort of strange because it looks like what they've done here is they've run the servos, they're just laid out opposite. So as you move one, they both move. But if they were laid out the same way, if this was pointed the same way, then they would just move the same direction like this, right? Well, we don't want them to move the same direction. We want them to move opposite directions. And so what, what's gonna happen is when they mount them like that, then one's gonna go up while the other one goes down. So suppose this is down and this one goes up. That's mean to your servos, by the way. It's gonna force the wing to go up like this and this wing to go down like that. And it rolls the airplane, okay? That's one control axis called roll. The other control axis is, axes are called yaw. That's yaw. When you yaw the plane, you're using the rudder or the steerable nose wheel. And then there's the elevator. The elevator lifts the nose up or points the nose down and it pivots the plane on the pitch axis, okay? So that's controlled by the elevator. So on the transmitter, this is yaw, this is throttle cut, <laughs> this is throttle. If the throttle cut was off, then this motor would spin, of course, if it was assembled and turned on and everything. This rolls the plane and this moves the elevator. That's called a mode two transmitter. Um, you can actually buy transmitters that are mode one and they're set up different for the sake of this video and avoiding confusion. Look it up if you wanna know. There's also a mode three and mode four. There's more, but I don't know anything about them, so I'm not gonna talk about them. Okay, so other things that are in the box, this is kind of an unbox and explanation. It's a lot more in depth. When we do new planes, we really try to get into the weeds to try to help some of you guys. And I know I'm answering questions that you didn't even know you had, some of you. Um, and that's okay, because you come here to learn, not just to watch a really awesome video. This is a rudder and vertical stabilizer. There's a control horn over here, and that's gonna manipulate the direction of the rudder. Okay, so this will ultimately get screwed down here. Construction has improved drastically on all these ready-to-fly airplanes. They used to be pretty terrible, okay? I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say that. SAFE, also known as Sensor Aided Flight Envelope, is a technology that Spectrum has released that's integrated into the receiver. It's not a separate flight controller, but it is a flight controller by some measure. And I'm just untaping this horizontal stabilizer, by the way. Uh, sensor Aided Flight Envelope will automatically level the plane when you let go of the sticks. That is a huge help for new pilots and for really bad pilots but generally for new pilots. Most pilots that stay in the game become good pilots because it's pretty hard not to. Um, okay, so this thing is in here kind of weird. There's a control horn that's fighting me getting it out. So I'm actually kind of moving that a little bit and seeing if there's some trick to get it out. There we go, I walked it out. Boy, that's weird. How exactly do you take that thing out? Do you see what I'm fighting? Does that middle, those middle no. ones don't come out? No. Is it? Do I have to go that way? slide all the way. Yeah, that way? Yeah. To your right? I didn't know I was going to have to teach you guys how to do this because I'm kind of struggling to do it myself. How did so, they get it in there? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure <laughs> out. Well, you can bend it a little bit, but I'm just afraid of breaking it. No, I'm just bending it. Look, I just folded it a little bit. Oh, okay. So there's a little bit of flexibility allowed. And you gotta remember, this is not a high performance plane, but it still performs well. And you'll see it, you actually be, you've already seen it. We unbox things after we fly them, for your sake. So that's a pinch hinge on a foam plane, and it's reinforced with tape all the way down the length and down the length. So it's quite strong. It's not impervious to damage, don't get me wrong, but it's quite strong compared to pinch hinges that aren't reinforced. But like on this plane over here, the Carbon Z Cub, which is a much more advanced plane, much more powerful. It's got a, um, you know, one wing probably costs more than this entire plane. That has a reinforced hinge that has plastic in it. 
Okay, so it's actually a pinch hinge, but it's got plastic inside of it. So we go over that type of detail. And then of course, you've got some carbon fiber in here. These are just simple strips. I don't even have to hold it up to the light so you can see it because they're just strips. That's actually just strips of, that's actually just a detail. That's just a pretty detail. This is carbon fiber. That is a, no, that is carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that stiffens it, but it's real thin, so it doesn't stiffen it a lot. You do want some flexibility on these planes when you're flying as a beginner because you're gonna make a lot of mistakes, and so you might as well not break it. If it's too brittle, you're gonna crash all the time and uh, damage every time you crash. This will help get you out of jail free card, um, and you can get up in the air quicker. So the elevator is moved by this control horn, which this is upright on this plane. Sometimes they're down, sometimes they're up, just depends on the plane. And that's gonna be all sandwiched on here with the rudder, okay? And it looks like we're empty except for maybe some nut and bolt sacks over here. All right, so we've got a folded in half manual, which drives me nuts. I hate when they fold the manuals. But once you get over the fact that it's folded, this manual is gonna be good. Manuals from Horizon are always very good. They're second to none. We review hundreds of planes, hundreds and hundreds of planes. And we have gotten some really terrible manuals. And we've gotten some really good manuals. In fact, I would say that the, act, the vast majority of manuals from Horizon are quite good. Mm -hmm. There have been a few that have been losers, but you know what, they fix them. So they send addendums and these sort of things. So this is gonna talk about the binding procedure for the plane. It's a manual addendum, like I was talking about. Now you can also get online and you can check. Now, if you're looking for a manual for a plane that I have reviewed, you can almost exclusively always check the link in the video description. That's where you would go to buy it and you'd be supporting us if you bought it there because we're affiliates so they give us a small commission, which is one of the easiest ways to support us, by the way. But if you click on that link, it'll bring you to where you can buy the plane. Well, if you scroll down a little bit, it's got a link that shows you like the tech manual. So you can just get it right there. They've got a registration thing in here. And then of course, some LiPo safety information, which we've already kind of discussed real briefly. If you wanna learn more about LiPo safety, just search for LiPo safety on Google. It's not rocket science, unless of course the LiPo's in a rocket, and then it is. So this manual is gonna show you what you need to do. Don't be afraid by the pages because it's in multiple languages. Yep. The English part is there. So what would you call that, like 12 pages? 15 pages, something mm -hmm. like that? And you're not gonna need every single page, but this gives you some new and helpful information for a new pilot. It's gonna talk about the direction of travel and all these things so that you don't have to know. I would highly, highly, highly recommend that in addition to watching this video and following the steps that we do, that you run through the manual. You can learn a lot that maybe I didn't touch on, which is gonna seem incredible when you look how long this video ends up being. But the point is I want you guys to have success and I don't want you to be a one and done. A one and done, what is a one and done, camera crew? Somebody who flies one plane, has a bad experience, and then quits. Yep, and this hobby is plagued with it. You wanna know why? Because people try to buy a cheap plane and they try to have a good experience because they see some skilled pilot. And I'm not trying to toot my own here, horn here, but I've been doing this six years and we've reviewed hundreds of planes, but we get the crappy ones and we can make them fly okay. And so people get them and they think they're gonna love it. Or you go to a hobby shop where you have a really good salesperson and they trick you into buying some piece of crap that's cheap because they know that you're only gonna spend 200 bucks and you, you know that's your budget regardless of what you need. I'm here to tell you right now, get a decent plane. You don't have to buy the best plane in the market, but you wanna buy something that's gonna get the job done. Squishy foam wheels. Or you buy a plane that's above your skill level just because it's a yep. cool plane, you like the way it looks. You're like, I need an F-16 right. 80mm EDF. Don't, Don't do, do that. that. You will crash it, you may hurt yourself, you're gonna definitely destroy a $185 battery, and then you're gonna come and complain on my channel about how horrible it was. Well, it's gonna be horrible if you don't know what you're doing. I mean, I'm just barely getting there myself, and I fly all the time. Okay, so it comes with rubber bands, looks like some, uh, you see that little piece in there? That's a fuel tube cutting right there next to my middle finger. Mm -hmm. That is gonna be used to help keep collars on like this. Uh, this clevis is gonna go around and bite into one of these control horns and you can replace that if it falls off, okay? So Horizon is very good about giving some spare parts, especially on the beginner planes. There's also some framework here for if you use the optional floats. They are not included in this plane, but if you get the timber, for instance, the timber 1.5 comes with floats. The mall, for instance, 
uh, it comes with floats as well. So uh, the Twin Otter comes with floats. They're all equipped with safe, not first time planes necessarily in my opinion. Uh, the Timber would maybe be a second or third plane, very conservative uh, second, or excuse me, very conservatively third plane, but a good pilot should be fine as a second plane. Um, now, would I use a DXS for a Timber? I would not recommend it. Can you use this and bind to your Timber? Yes. Binding speaks to teaching this to talk to that specific receiver. Okay, that's what binding is. That replaces the whole concept of crystals where you had a 72.1 megahertz um, or you know a 68 or whatever it is, okay? We don't have to do that anymore. We just bind. So you get a transmitter, you turn it on, um, and you know everything just initiates and they talk together. It's great. We also have something new if you're coming back to the hobby that you didn't have years ago. By the way, this box is totally empty now, and so we'll just throw that aside. We have telemetry. Telemetry is where we have feedback. So this is really actually a transmitter and a receiver. It's receiving information from that transmitter. This is a flyby uh, telemetry, which means that the telemetry is not quite as full range as an AR637T or TA. That has an AR637TA, which is for a bind and fly model. And I regularly, routinely use AR637Ts in bind and, uh, or excuse me, plug and fly planes where you have to plug in your own receiver and provide your own battery as well. This is a ready to fly, which means you get everything you need to actually get flying. So we're gonna continue the process by building now. Um, just keep in mind, if you have questions too, all the way along the way, just ask them in the comments below. But bear in mind, I'm gonna go over a lot of information. So I'm probably gonna cover most of your questions if you keep watching. Now, see this? What does that say? Trim programming or reversing. Mm -hmm. Oh, pretty cool. Like so it talks about that and that's pretty cool. Now also I want to talk about this very briefly because I'm not going to go into great detail. There are model profiles for airplanes and for helicopters that you can put onto this transmitter. Would I recommend it? Absolutely not. You, know, you want to know why? Because this transmitter is going to handicap you so severely compared to getting into something that you really need. If you're gonna be in the hobby, get a computerized transmitter and get it sooner than later. Here's why. You're gonna to need to set up all sorts of things that you don't even know you need, like Exponential, also known as Expo. It's gonna soften the center of the sticks. It's gonna make you feel like you're in better control of this random moving object that all of a sudden you're now responsible for, which by the way, pause, you are fully responsible for this plane when you get it off the ground. And when it hits you in the head, it's gonna be your fault. So you need to remember that when you take off, you'll understand, because it's gonna be crazy. You'll be like, yeah, this guy online, he said, yeah, I'm responsible once I get off the ground. It's so easy. I've seen these guys, man, it should be easy. And then you're gonna get off the ground and you're gonna say, holy crap, what just happened? What did I get myself into? And it's gonna be like somewhere between being in a terrible traffic jam stress-wise and having a minor heart attack stress-wise. And you'll, you're gonna laugh when it happens because I'm calling it right now because Trust me, anybody who's flown a radio controlled airplane understands what I'm talking about. The first couple times you fly, you are gonna be freaking out because it is scary. Um, but it is also one of the most rewarding and most fun things that you can do. And you cannot buy this skill, you have to learn this skill. So if you're really scared and you really wanna have a lot of practice and start building and developing muscle memory, of course I don't even look at the sticks or I don't have to, but I still do it just because I'm you know, observing what's going on. Um, then you can get simulators. But I don't recommend simulators. I recommend getting a simple plane and then maybe getting a simulator to fly when it's windy out or it's rainy or it's snowy because I learn from real experience. Some people, like kids for instance, love to learn on simulators because they're used to video games. I'm an adult, I don't play video games much. But when I do play video games, it does help a little bit with muscle memory. So if you have kids, don't be embarrassed when they outpace your skill um, in flying radio controlled airplanes. I practiced in the simulator. She did because she's scared of crashing. Yes. And that's fair enough. And that's whatever gets the job done. And I also, if I fly, I fly with Brian or with our son because I want somebody else to land for me. 
Right. Because that's the part that freaks me out. <laughs> but you don't have to necessarily have a perfect landing no. to get a plane on the ground. You can land in tall grass, you can cut off the throttle, you just shut the throttle down, and you bring it in, and auto leveling, safe, sensorated flight envelope, will keep the plane level. And you literally just shut the throttle off and you kind of like point it where you need it to go. And then, okay, well, it rolled over, who cares? It doesn't hurt anything, generally. Sometimes you, you can hurt them, but most of the time it doesn't. Yeah. So, continuing onward, so we're gonna put in the batteries right now. We're just gonna do this step by step. It's not like we're going in any, any particular order here. Now also, this is a great place to hide your bind plug if you have a bind plug. We'll show you what that is shortly. I didn't see one, but we there, haven't gotten in the bag. It's in the bag. So there's a, there's a negative and there's a positive. I'm hoping, if you don't know that, you're probably not getting this model for yourself. You're getting it for your kid or something like that. By the way, I need to make you aware of something. This plane is over 250 grams, and that means that there is a no before you fly website that you should probably check out if you're in North America. If you're in Europe, you got all sorts of weird laws, so just look up your laws and, you know, we. But in, in our case, if you're in North America, you're buying this thing, um, just figure out what the rules are and do what you need to do to be in compliance because it's really not that big a deal in, the, in North America right now. If you're flying for recreation, it's quite easy. If, however, you're flying uh, for a career or something like that, then you, you, know, you need a 107 exemption. Um, and so just do a little bit of research. Be safe. Don't crash into yourself or your you know, cars that are sitting around and uh, buildings and power lines and things like that. We fly on our own property. We have power lines that, yes, we did buy and, yes, we did pay for. So before you guys get all freaked out about that, don't worry. If I hit them, I bought them. So um, I don't know if you guys realize that, but when you put in power lines, you buy them. So, and it's not cheap. Yep, super cheap. So anyway, getting back to the point. So when you see the way that we fly in the environments that we fly in, sometimes that will be a little bit tempting to go to, uh, you know, like your neighbor's house and fly in front of it, which would be smarter than your own house. But that being said, sometimes a park is a great place to learn but you have to be careful. Some rules are in place in different environments and you have to be a little bit careful so you can respect those rules. That's all I'm gonna talk about. You're adults, you figure it out on your own. So that being said, I'm gonna stick these landing gear in here too, by the way, cause I just, I wanna put this thing on its wheels cause it's gonna look cooler. We've got some clips that we have to install, but I'm just gonna plop that down like this. Okay, so back to the fun parts. Obviously we have power on this and we've got the batteries in. So you can press this, the lights come on. This is the RF indicator it's going to change conditions when it gets connected and then those lights are status lights to indicate what uh, profile you're connected to when you first power it on it's also going to give us some feedback on the batteries in certain uh, on certain planes like the t28 uh, what other plane the habu as a ready to fly has telemetry data that tells you your battery voltage on this pack the one that's inside the plane so you know when it's dying and it basically goes from four to three to two to one, and then it starts flashing when it's low. And then if you still don't respond to that, then the motor will eventually pulse. So if you cut your throttle to nothing, then the LiPo will recover and come back a little bit. And then a lot of times you can fly for a little longer. But I would say if it goes to low voltage warning, it's a good idea to land. All right, so flight times on these planes are pretty long. And that's why they can send a small battery, but you can use different size batteries if you weren't already aware. Okay, so looking at the manual, this is gonna tell you how to build stuff, but of course we're gonna show you right now. If you're not sure what's included in this plane, you can also look through all of this stuff. Here's some information about the LED colors. This talks about the different uh, conditions and what the lights mean. So for instance, on ours, we have a purple flashing light and it's a uh, double flash single, double flash, yeah, I can tell it's charging. It's warm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another another really good idea for lipo safety. Charge on a hard surface, and if you don't have a hard surface, then find a hard surface and use that. Like if you have a few cookie sheets or something like that. If you don't have like a granite countertop or you know something like that, an island or a kitchen sink that's made of metal. Um, I wouldn't recommend necessarily putting batteries in your sink, but if that's the only option you've got, that might be a good option. Um, and as you get progressively larger lipos, you need to use a little bit different care and more care maybe. But um, also there's safe disposal if you would damage one. Uh, so just look that up on Google and you can educate yourself a little bit. Generally speaking, it's not a big deal. These things are very protective of the batteries if you would crash at full speed into the side of your house, the battery is probably gonna do okay. Um, and I know that from experience. So 
That being said, information on page four, we'll, we'll go over all that for you. This shows you the layout of the switches in the transmitter. This shows you how to take off and replace the prop should you break it, and you probably will if you're a new pilot. So don't freak out when you break your prop. Yes, you can order parts. All you have to do is follow the link in the description below and you can order props. You can also order the plane and then buy a couple of props because the free shipping that you'll get from Horizon uh, is going to allow you to order a couple of different items. And then, you know, say you're getting this for you or your kids and you wanna just make sure you're covered, just get a couple of props. You know, if you throw away $15, you're not gonna, it's, trust me, you're getting into a hobby where you're gonna do worse. So, <laughs> just warning you now. Okay, so continuing onward, this talks about the sensor-aided flight envelope safe technology. This is um, the button up on the top of the bind plug. And uh, fail safe is basically what happens when you would lose radio contact. The plane is gonna go into basically a holding pattern. It's gonna cut the throttle and it's gonna come down and crash into the ground or tree or whatever it is. But it's not gonna actually do much of anything other than loiter its way down. Here's the key, if it's really windy, it's gonna loiter and lift, loiter and lift, and it will go for literally miles, and we call that a flyaway. Don't be that guy. I was teaching my neighbor to fly once. This is back when we lived in a, a town close by. And uh, his wife came home, and we were flying, and he was in control. And so he stopped to say hi to his wife. Don't do that. <laughs> Dan, if you're watching, I forgive you. But yeah, that was very crazy. And yes, we did find the plane. It was a mile away. Do you remember that? I do. The grass was like this tall and it was in a shady part of town. Okay. Where, where? It was like a mile south of where we lived. And a mile south of where we lived, I did not want to be in that guy's backyard. So anyway, don't be that guy. I wasn't apparently in the backyard. No, he wasn't, but I could hear him in the window with the shotgun. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, all right, getting back to this. Out that part of this, this is where we're talking about the wing install. This is where we start. Okay, so they're suggesting that we go ahead and put the landing gear in first, which is what I was thinking. There's some clips and things in these bags, so let's just work our way through. Uh, this doesn't come with a Phillips screwdriver, I don't think, which is ironic because we get millions of screwdrivers from millions of different planes, just not this one. Grab Horizon, if you're listening, have China throw some of those in there, please. They've got plenty sitting around. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we have these little clip doohickeys. Looks like they have a variety of them. Now, the reason you'll, you'll notice that there's two different styles. Uh, these have a little bump, and they're labeled R and L. And then these are kind of like a curve. That's because when you're putting on floats, you do it different, okay? The floats are gonna require, I'm gonna shut this off by the way so I don't waste the battery. These are gonna require, I think the little rounded ones like that. See how that works? So it kind of goes up in the air a little bit. And then these ones are going to go up here. I would recommend installing them even though you don't need them now. The reason I recommend that is because I don't wanna search for this stuff later but if you're like me and you have 200 planes in your basement or 300 planes or 400 or however many it is we're up to, it's very hard to keep track of these things. Yeah. The catch is that you're going to waste weight on the screws. So there is a bag of screws. They look like they're all the same. Looks like self-tapping plastic pan head screws, nothing fancy. They are all the same, which is helpful. Some planes are not the same, like the carbon Z cub. Yep. That was ridiculous many, many, many different types of screws. Love the plane, hated the uh, number of screws. Yep. So number two, Phillips screwdriver is what I'm assuming we're gonna need. Yeah. Number two speaks to the tip size. And I'll get a China screwdriver. So if you guys have one of these screwdrivers from one of the ready to fly planes you got from China at one point, we only have like 40 of these in our drawer. So. We'll just try this. It's a really good fit, but let's use a number two to show you what that looks like. Uh, the number two is pretty big. So you're gonna have to have what, this is called a precision screwdriver, as opposed to like, this is a number two, a P2. A P1 would be fine. So I'm just gonna use this Chinese screwdriver. It works fine. And we're gonna tighten these screws. And before we get too terribly far, I wanna show you another trick. So this, can't, this, this is a hatch cover. Okay, so it goes like this. And then when you're ready to 
get your battery installed. You can put that on and then put this there. The first thing I'm gonna do, because I don't like to search for those things when they pop off, uh -oh. I'm gonna use a piece of clear tape and I'm gonna use a pair of scissors and I'm gonna tape that thing on there. This is obviously an optional step. For those of you that are new to our channel, I'm assuming anytime we do a new model like this where it's kind of like a beginner plane, um, there, there's a lot of questions. We want you to feel like safe to ask what you would think are stupid questions. Um, because first of all, if you're trying to avoid you know, asking stupid questions, you're in the wrong field because there are a lot of questions that you are gonna come up with. Don't be ashamed of asking a stupid question. Better to ask a stupid question now than to crash your plane into your face, okay? I'm just saying that because I know from experience not crashing into my face, but um, it's just, it's, there's a lot to learn. And everybody at these hobby companies just assumes that you guys know it. Like, why would you know half of this stuff? Yeah. Unless you watch my channel. So if you don't know, don't feel bad. You're not alone. When I got, I, I've been an RC all my life, but not radio controlled airplanes. I would have killed for the technology that we have now as a kid. I love this stuff. It is so much fun. It is so much cheaper. It is so much more accessible. It is so much better. Yeah. And so many, I mean, even in the six years that we've been doing this, Megan and I, Megan and the camera crew is my wife, if you haven't connected the dots yet. <laughs> the technology has improved greatly. And I mean, yeah, they still use the same foam tires, right? And they still use EPO foam, but the foam is better. Believe it or not, the foam is actually better. It's a lot better. It's not a little better. It's a lot better. It's lighter. It's more robust. It's cleaner. It looks better. It smells better. It's glued together better. They have trained the employees at the, the factories where they're making these things to do better work. The decals are applied more consistently. And part of the reason that you go with a slightly more expensive plane like this than some of the competitive options, and there are, uh, and we probably reviewed them too, by the way, um, is that when you get a Horizon plane, you generally have a good experience. Now, I'm not saying there's never a bad experience because this is RC hobby. And uh, within the RC hobby, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong. When they do, Horizon can make it right and they will. Um, some of the competitive brands, I cannot necessarily say that for. Now, I'm not gonna throw everybody under the bus, but Horizon is one of the best for making things right. So, that being said, if you get a plane and you have a lemon, they'll help make it right. That doesn't mean that it's fun to have that happen, but it does happen. And I want you to be aware that from all the other companies, and believe me, I've done it all, we didn't always work with these guys, okay? They are one of the best to deal with. Not from just a perspective of bringing things for review on YouTube, but I'm talking about like as a customer that's paying, look at the cats. We are gonna have a problem with these cats here pretty quick. <laughs> I think it's time to do some training. Don't let your cats eat your planes. It's frustrating. Yes, get back. Don't eat the plane. I think I'm probably gonna to have to move that, huh? Yeah, maybe so. All right, we'll pause and do that. So I was just gushing about how great Horizon is. So they are a good company to work with. You'll find that they make good quality products. You'll note that I'm not saying they make the best things in the world because I don't think there's any one particular company that does that. I think everybody that's in the RC hobby right now is they're all making good stuff except for maybe. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, if you couldn't understand that was on purpose. Um, okay. So we lay this down. There's some holes. They line up. Believe it or not, this step is a problem for some manufacturers. Yeah. And we will also tell you about that. So when you get into a hobby where you review these aircraft, then sometimes what happens is you'll, you'll get some folks that are upset that they don't get to review the airplanes the way that we do. And, and I completely get it. Um, but the thing is, like, you gotta remember guys, there's hundreds and hundreds of different opportunities uh, to see different aircraft and different conditions and to be able to bring this stuff to you is an honor and privilege but also it takes a lot of work so my wonderful camera crew is not into this like i am she just helps because she loves me so right did i cover that pretty good <laughs> so there there's such a thing too as a plane stand you don't have to have a plane stand 
but a plain stand does make this easier. This is an inexpensive tool. You don't have to use it. We used to use um, blankets until I cut holes in my wife's blankets. And then I kept using those for years longer. And then some random person on our YouTube channel felt bad for my wife and he bought us this plane stand. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. And we, and we still use it to this day. Yep. Okay, so since there's only so many screws, I'm assuming these screws are the right screws. I would assume so. There's two holes here. This foam is not EP, this is not EPO, this is EPS. So it's very brittle and easy to break. So just be aware of that. If you put your finger into that, it's gonna break through. Okay. Oh yeah, definitely you're right. You guys probably take for granted that that was so easy, but we have <laughs> literally spent hours, hours, hours trying to do that on planes mm -hmm. from competitive brands. Multiple times. Because what happens is they don't have a jig or they don't know what they're doing at the factory and they make them and they're not jigged and you can't line the holes up. Yep. And you'll spend hours fixing it. It's infuriating. You also notice that there's plastic here. This is the type of finish detail that you're gonna get from Horizon that you don't necessarily get from other brands. Now again, I'm not trying to beat up other brands. They make things, they're on a different price point maybe, but if you're apples to apples on price and you're getting a Horizon, an E-Flight or a Hobby Zone versus some other competitive brands, okay? You're gonna tend to find good luck there, okay? Not perfect, not like this is just as good as the Carbon Z Cub or anything like that. It's far inferior to that, but it's a great beginner play. And it does things that the Carbon Z Cub won't do, like fly at one mile an hour or two. And also fly fast, which is fun. Okay, so we have the plane assembled. Now we just gotta start putting stuff together. Now you'll notice I didn't hook these things up yet. That's because I haven't had an opportunity to, one, and then two, I don't know where the servos are going to end up when I turn it on, because then I'll know where they are and I can position them appropriately. Because what happens is these little, these little, Adapters have to be spun out, okay? So the clevis has to be turned on this threaded rod, okay? This is another point of contention with some competitive brands, is that you're gonna have hardware that looks the same, but then it's like brittle plastic and they aren't, they aren't instead of being fine thread, it's like coarse thread, which, how can that be that big a deal? It is, because when you turn it, it goes like a millimeter instead of going like a third of a millimeter. And so then you don't have the adjustment here and then you have to use it in your trim and it, it's just all these little details add up to a finished product that's good, okay? So let's hope we have good luck with this now. Okay, so inside of here, there is an ESC that's sticking out, okay? You can see these three wires, that's what goes to the brushless motor. If your motor incidentally goes the wrong direction, you can unplug any two of these wires, switch them and the motor will go the correct direction, okay? You shouldn't have to do that. Again, that's something you get with the other competitive brands, but you, if you ever run into it on here, that's one option. The other option is to reprogram the ESC. The electronic speed controllers are generally programmable and you can program them from the transmitter by going into a series of programming steps where you have your throttle cut off, full throttle, turn on the radio, have it on, then energize your plane. This is after you've bound to it, okay? and then it's gonna start beeping. That'll get you into a programming mode. So what you have to do is you have to find out what ESC it is and what the manual states. I do not know what this ESC programming is. And so for the record, I'm not gonna walk you through that, but I just want you to be aware that that is a thing you can do. And uh, as you advance through the hobby, there's gonna be other times where you wanna turn on different features like braking and that's where this motor actively stops the prop from spinning or maybe thrust reverse, like what we have on the Avian ESCs. That's a very cool feature. If you're curious about this plane, it's a Carbon Z Cub. It's 84 inches, it's huge. I'm six foot tall, it's like this much taller than me. And yes, my son was flying it yesterday, which is really, or a couple days ago when we filmed that. So that's really cool. If you haven't seen the unbox build and radio setup, you should watch that one. It's long and tedious, but we go over a lot of details. The other thing too is you'll notice that this uh, linkage here that goes from the steerable nose gear up to the uh, rudder servo. You see how close that is? That wire? I hate that wire being there. I hate that, you see that? I'm gonna show you a trick to resolve that problem before it becomes a real problem. I'm gonna take an X-Acto knife. Now, if you don't have an X-Acto knife, you can use um, just a utility knife, whatever you open the box with. 
Okay, so this is an X-Acto knife. They're extremely sharp and they work very good. If you are gonna be in this hobby for any period of time, you should invest in an X-Acto knife. You can get these at a hobby shop for a couple bucks or you can find them on horizonhobby.com, okay? So I'm gonna take and just make a little slice here. This is about a quarter inch deep and it's at a bit of an angle and I'm gonna rotate the angle. You wanna know why I rotate the angle? Why? It holds the wire then. Mm. And then I'm gonna take a screwdriver that's not related to this and I'm just gonna open up the pocket a little bit. If you had a flat one, I'd probably be a little bit better. But all I'm doing is just making a pocket to hold the wire. It's very simple. And I just wanna keep it away from that moving mechanism. Um, this is, like I said, this is probably overkill. It's probably not necessary, but I'm just doing it as a precautionary measure. A lot of times my son flies these planes after we get done reviewing them when they're kind of like a beginner plane. You know, I don't find myself going out to the flight field and grabbing the apprentice every day, but I actually do love flying them. So, and you're like, whatever, Brian, you got an F-16, you just fly that all day long. No, actually I don't. I love flying it, but it's also quite stressful. So, because I'm still learning. Okay, so now that holds that, and it keeps it away from this linkage that's gonna move up and back. All right, now these two wires, this goes to the ESC, and then these two wires are uh, what we call a Y cable. So that's plugged into one of the channels for the ailerons. So they only labeled one. I think it probably fell off of the other one, I guess. And then of course, this one goes to the uh, elevator and this one goes to the rudder. So we don't even have to plug in the wires. We just have to plug in the wing, okay? So the wing is here. So let's lift that up. Now, you'll notice that these go through a Y cable. It is possible to do what's called flaperons. Flaps are not ailerons. Ailerons are on the outboard portion of the wing, typically. Sometimes they're full length. They go all the way to the middle of the plane, the inboard portion, the outboard portion. And they would normally go here and they would lower down. Now, flaps do not uh, roll the plane. They change the shape of the wing so that the angle of attack, where it's pointing up and down wise, can be brought so that the pilot can look and see a runway. Also, so that you can descend without gaining speed, it adds uh, extra drag, okay, which is like friction in the air, and it's going to allow the stall speed to be lowered. And what is the stall speed? The stall speed is when the plane stops flying and there's no longer lift and it falls, okay? So, lowering the stall speed, increasing the drag, and helping <laughs> to change the angle of attack so that you can look at the runway. That's literally what happens in a real plane, just like this uh, XPR 737, just like this Carbon Z Cub. We have flaps on this plane. We don't have flaps on that, it's one of my biggest complaints actually, but this plane does not have flaps. You won't need it because it's a slow flying plane. This little bump out, I forget what they call that. I apologize for not knowing what that's called. I should know, but I just can't think of it right now. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna help to reduce the stall tendencies of a plane. Now, at some point, if you should choose to add flaps, you can add flaps by cutting them into this wing. I have done that on a million different planes. I did it on that Cessna Longitude UMX. That is a little EDF powered plane that's right there. That's a Horizon plane. It's made by E-Flight. I added flaps to this. This has an electric ducted fan. That's what a little jet is, okay? So you see how there's little ducted fans. Those fans spin and they scream loud. Yes. So, and also an uh, awesome plane, by the way, but not a beginner plane. <laughs> nope. You got to start here. You got you to gotta work with the training wheels for a few weeks, months, years, depending on how fast you advance. Okay, so you see how this is brown, red, and orange? Okay, I consider that to be the Hextronics color code or JR color code. And then the white, black, and red would be... Um, the Futaba color code. Okay. I think I might be seeing this wrong here. Okay, so brown, of course, is your negative, and then red is your positive, and then orange or yellow, depending on how you look at that color, that'd be like an orange or yellow, then there's red, then there's brown. Brown is negative, red is power, plus voltage, so in this case, like five, 5.5 volts from the BEC, the battery eliminator circuit, which also drives all the electronics aside from the motor. The ESC has a built-in BEC. And then the orange or the yellow, in this case, would be signal. So the signal goes into the servo and then the servo knows 
the predetermined position that that armature should be pointed. And that's how you command and control your aircraft. Also, the receiver uses all that stuff that's going on to make decisions as well based on its position in reality. So it knows where it's positioned. Watch this, you see those two wires? You don't want those to end up in your servo. So here's a trick real quick. See how I'm just spinning this wing? It's kind of awkward, but you can do it, I promise. So you see how I spun that a few times? As we spin that, that is going to kind of keep everything tidy. Now you don't want to spin it so it's tight, but then when I lower this down in here, I can keep those wires from falling into all these moving areas. Okay, see how it went forward? That's what we want. Okay, so now these plastic guards will help that the rubber bands don't bite into your wings. So we're gonna go ahead and rubber band on everything now. And we were talking about the BEC, the battery eliminator circuit is what energizes the portion of your control circuit for all of your servos and the, the electronic speed control typically houses that, but sometimes in high performance EDFs, electric ducted fans, they are actually um, a secondary device. Where did that thing go? Oh, oh, it's over there. Yes, I see it, will you pause? Okay, so I had to pick that stuff up to get into my rubber bands. So these are just run of the mill rubber bands. By the way, little tip for you, if you get rubber bands from the office supply store and you find that they get brittle and break easily quickly, get baby powder, put them into a jar or a bag and put a bunch of baby powder in there. That will keep lubricating your rubbers. I'm serious. Why are you giving me that look? <laughs> okay, so I'm holding this down and I'm pulling this back. See how the wing wants to pop off? This is where it's kind of handy to have a second set of hands, but I've learned my lesson enough times trying to put a wing on that the easiest way is if you can go diagonal, try to go diagonal. These foam planes are slick when they're new. They're slick because the mold release that comes from the factory, okay? I just wanna warn you, as you do this the first couple of times, you are going to probably put some dings and dents in the foam. Don't worry, it's gonna be dented in a few minutes after you fly. <laughs> I'm serious and trying to say it in a nice way. Remember, I'm like, uh, if, if, if you don't have somebody teaching you how to do this, I can help teach you how to do it, okay? That's why you're here. And if you're here just to watch us stumble and bumble our way through, um, then you can enjoy that too. But really, we know what we're doing even if it doesn't look like it. There's just a lot to cover. So if you think I'm jumping around, it's because there is a lot of opportunities to do so. Okay, so now we have an X. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna grab, see, I, you can stretch these out beforehand and that's fine. Okay, I'm gonna go around the front. I pulling it, I'm pulling it into my belly and then I can control. It's much easier once you get the X done. Then I lay this flat, okay? See how I got a little twist in there? So I come back and do it again until it's right. See how it's flat? I always like to overlap them. They just look a lot nicer. And yes, I keep the wings on my planes, but really for practical purposes, if you want your rubber bands to last longer, you should take them off if they're stored for some time. You know, if you're storing it for a few weeks or a month or you know, a couple of months, you'll probably be fine. But if you store this thing for like uh, seven months during winter and it's like out in the garage and it goes through freeze thaws a couple of times, they may actually break. So just always grab the wing and give it a couple of rocks. See how solid that is? I mean, obviously all it has to do is hold this very light structure, but it holds it just fine. And then if you get in an accident, it can move a little bit, okay? It will dent here and it will dent here, but the plane will survive, okay? And no, it does not need to be pretty to fly. In fact, these planes, very surprisingly, they will tend to fly a little bit better once you crash them a few times and throw hot glue all over them. I don't know why that is, but it's just totally true. And I kind of hate it because every time I crash them, I cringe too. Um, but they hold up really good. I mean, this is something you couldn't do back in the day. Everybody was basically, there was, there was tons of one and done pilots, but you had to spend three months building it first out of balsa wood and uh, CA. And now we have a tool called kicker, which I didn't have as a kid. And you'd put it on, you put it on your uh, cytoacrylite, which is CA and it's like super glue and you put it on there and it's set like that right now. I mean, not like 30 seconds or 10 seconds or seven seconds, which by the way, when you glue like 400 joints in a plane, that is amazing time savings. 
you can build a plane in half the time. Okay, so you'll notice we aren't hooked up on the uh, elevator or the rudder, and that's no problem. And you'll notice the pile of tools over here. I just want you guys to elaborate on this for a second. We didn't use the number two, so we didn't need that. We just used a small tip Phillips screwdriver. Phillips, of course, has the cross there. And then we used a pair of scissors, which is kind of optional because we were using the tape. We used an X-Acto knife, which is, again, somewhat optional. You could have done that with a sharp utility knife. I recommend a sharp utility knife for safety reasons, of course. And then we used some clear tape, nothing fancy about that. Everything else came with this plane. Okay, so the transmitter's on. We're pretty much to the point now where we're gonna do what we would normally call a radio setup. Now, it's super easy on this plane because it's already set up for us. So all we have to do really is just go ahead and hook up the battery. Now, in this case, I'm gonna cheat a little bit because we're filming this. We have a flashing purple. What does flashing purple mean? Charging, I think. I think it means charging too. So we're just going to the manual for this. Um, purple, charge complete is green solid. Okay, so we'll double flash is 25 through 75. Is that a, tri is that a triple or double? We are at Oh, we're at triple flash now. Triple flash means 76 through 99% charge. So, so that means it's, it's close. But for the sake of doing our testing and setup, we'll use another identical battery. This is exactly the same size, 1300 milliamp 3S 30C. Now let's talk about batteries again for a minute. 1300 speaks to the amount of capacity in this overall pack and individual cells, okay? I'm gonna show you another pack here. This is a 1S pack. So there's only one cell in series, which is stupid because it's not in series because there's only one cell. You have to have two by the nature of the measurement or by the nature of the meaning of series. But we still refer to this as a 1S pack. This is a 3S pack. So there's three 1300 milliamp cells. This is one 800 milliamp cell. So the milliamp hours speaks to the uh, amount of amps, and in this case, one thousandths of them, that's what a milliamp is. And so this is just under one amp hour, okay? This is just over one amp hour, and we divide them up into milliamp hours because it's easier and more convenient. But really, there's three of them that are operating in series. So if you want a bigger battery, a bigger battery is a 4S battery. It's also a bigger battery would be a 2200 milliamp. Well, which one do I need? As long as you're a 3S pack, you can fly it on this plane. So here's another option, 2200 3S. You could tell from the size of the pack and similar construction, it's a little bit bigger, which makes sense. So you're about 900 milliamp hours larger to go from this to this. And that stands to reason because it's a little bit longer. Now there's still some similar structure in here from the smart chips that do all the balancing. And then of course, where all the leads connect to each of the individual cells as they're constructed. So that's common and that's common, but the rest of this is just the battery, okay? Then later, when you start getting really serious and you've got your 7,006 S's, you can see that goes up quite a bit. It's both bigger in all dimensions. This is a 30 C pack and believe it or not, we go up to currently in the smart realm, we're going up to 100 C. 100 C speaks to the speed by which you can discharge this pack without it catching on fire essentially. Okay, so at this point, you don't need to be worrying about 100C packs or 50C packs, but you can buy a 50C pack and use it in a 30C plane application, but you can't use a 30C in a 100C application or you will destroy the pack or you'll damage the airplane. I hope that helps you guys to understand what we're looking at. So basically, if you want a bigger pack, you can get a three cell or three S pack and you can use it. You just have to make sure it balances out on the center of gravity. But I can tell you this from experience on this plane, if it fits in the battery cavity, you can essentially fly it. <clears throat> but the basic principles of flight <clears throat> dictate that you get the center of gravity right, which we will use the standard stock LiPo. And that will help you guys to understand that this pack is fine, okay? Now you could also probably get a couple of these and put them in parallel but you can't put them in series because that would make a 3S into a 6S with another one in series. But if they're in parallel, then you can run two smaller 3S packs and run a plane like this. But they need to be of consistent wear and tear 
consistent charge and consistent condition. Otherwise you run the risk of discharging one more than the other and then getting into an unsafe condition. So we're gonna flip this thing open. You can see we're kind of struggling to get that pulled down. If you want, you can put a piece of tape on here and it'll give you something to lift it up with. Okay, one of the steps I take that I don't recommend if you're inexperienced is to cut off this warning because, oh, actually it almost came off for me. I hate this label, it always gets in the way, but it is a good reminder for you to watch your fingers. And I'm gonna teach you a trick. Uh, if you ever watch any of my videos, I talk a lot about the throttle cut. This is the throttle cut on this transmitter. That's off, that's on, okay? So when you're flying along, and then there's a lanyard hook up here. I use a lanyard when I'm flying, it holds around my neck, and then I can let go of the transmitter, pick up the plane, whatever it is I need to do. I have the freedom to let go. On this one, it doesn't come with it, so you're not gonna have it, okay? So, sticks down all the time for safety, and you always check for the throttle cut. So as soon as you land, or if you think you're gonna crash, you cut the throttle, or you cut the throttle, or you do both. But then you all, build the habit now. Stick down, okay? Not like that, don't ever leave the stick like that. I don't care if it's sitting there. If you walk by and the cat moved it, pull it down. Because you don't wanna get cut the first time you turn it on. Now. These things will not initiate until that stick is down also. So rest assured there are some safety measures, but every single safety measure in life will fail at some point. Don't trust it, trust yourself, okay? All right, good. So now we're gonna bind this plane. It's gonna be super easy. Actually, I don't even think we have to bind. So this is how you would do it if you were gonna bind. You would plug this in and then you would follow the binding procedures. But since this comes from the factory bound, we don't need to, but it does come with that bind plug. Okay, this is what the bind plug looks like. It's got a wire that goes from the ground, from the ground to the signal, okay? So you're not gonna short anything out that's gonna damage it. It's just gonna go from the signal wire to the ground, okay? If it was going from the middle wire to the outside, that'd be bad, you would fry something. Okay, so this battery goes in something like this. There's a battery strap in here, okay? I wanna get these battery leads out of the way. I'm gonna slide this through just like that. And then you'll notice I put my wire so it's pointed to the back. And I'm gonna kinda of basically stuff that all the way toward the front. Now why am I doing that, camera crew? For the center of gravity. Yep, and you'll notice it's pretty loose right now. That's just mostly because I don't care really where it is, but I'm gonna go a little bit tighter now. The thing is with these straps, sometimes they're designed for a little bit more flexibility for like another pack that's bigger. And so they're kinda of long. These are high quality straps. They're easy to tug on without ripping in half. I want this to be pulled through and I'm struggling to get it pulled through and I'll show you the trick. You see how there's a little bit of a pucker there? What you have to do is you have to do a little bit on each side, okay? So you can pull this through and I'm gonna push this down and then I'm gonna pull this up. See, I'm doing it just one step at a time. Yep. It's kind of a pain, but if you want to get it manipulated through so it's a little easier to do every single time, it'd be a good time investment since it's a new plane. Now, I'm going to press this down and show you the other way. You press hard and you fold it over the edge and then you just slap that down. Okay, that's another way you can do it if it's so long that you can't get it through, right? Because if you can't pull it tight, then you're not going to be able to get this thing to hold on properly. Okay, remember this... This is, um, the door is gonna be closing it in, but you still wanna make sure that it's secured because you don't want this to shift forward and backward. But for the sake of, of getting this plane in the air, the big thing is I wanna demonstrate that the CG is not gonna be impacted much by the position of this battery. That is your number one criteria for getting the center of gravity right typically in a plane. You see how I'm also taking this tail and I'm sticking it back on there. You see what happened? That made a blockade so the battery can't move and it's blocked up against the firewall here or the front part of the battery opening. Okay, so I'm gonna just drop this down in here because we don't need to get to it right away. And I'm just gonna make it so it's kind of easy to get out, but it's not in the way. Then these things are keyed, you can't put them in wrong, but if you wanna study it, this is the positive and this is the negative. This is the negative, excuse me, this is the positive and this is the negative, but there is no smart lead. Okay, the smart lead would come out of this hole. Okay, so we're gonna plug this in and then we wanna quickly flip it over and get it on its feet, okay, so to speak. And you'll notice I didn't do it very fast. I also don't have my transmitter on yet. That's so that the ESC doesn't arm and so that it doesn't initiate until I'm prepared. That's only because it's an upside down load. 
So I'm gonna put my hand on it for safety and I'm gonna turn this on. You notice that it's orange. Now it's danced once and now twice. That's what I mean by once and twice. There's two sequences. Later on when you advance to uh, bigger and better planes, then you'll see either one sequence or two to indicate if you're in AS3X, which is artificial stabilization three axis. That's AS3X is the basis of safe sensor aided flight envelope. That's what levels your plane when you're flying it automatically when you let go of the sticks. AS3X, however, is stabilization. So if the wind is coming along and it blows up your wing like this, it's gonna actuate this aileron and the other one and it's gonna to try to counter that impact because it knows that you didn't give it any input, okay? So first things first, there's lights, they're green, that's good, this light's on, elevator up and down, uh oh, we didn't hook it up, so we gotta do that. Rudder, left and right. Let's go ahead and hook these up now that we know what position they're in. We wanna get these things pretty much square and flat. So you can see if I were to hook that up, I'm gonna hook it to the inside hole. If you're inexperienced, you wanna to go to the outside hole. Okay, the manual is gonna indicate where to actually put it. What does the manual suggest? I'm not sure. So the manual is gonna tell you where to put that. They say the outside hole. That's gonna give you the least amount of control authority. And then for the rudder, mm, right there. here's all of them. Outside hole for all of them, okay? okay? So we're gonna actually put it into the inside hole and it's gonna give us more throw, which is gonna give us more control authority but in safe, you're limited to bank angles, and uh, in this case, pitch angles and bank angles. That's gonna help prevent you from tipping the plane upside down. Okay, so all you have to do is just grab this thing and kind of line it up where you want it to go. See, if I plugged it into that bottom, it's gonna push down on it. So I wanna bring this in a couple of turns. One, two turns or two half turns. And then I'm gonna take my fingernails and just pull this open. And I'm just gonna sandwich it around there and then slide it through just like that. Now let's show them from the side. This is pretty straight now. See how it's pretty straight? Now when I pull up, it goes up. When I push down, it goes down. Cool. Now, if you're a beginner plane, you'll want to put it all the way at the top hole. That's going to give you less throw. Throw speaks to the movement of the control surface. This is the elevator and this is the horizontal stabilizer. Elevator, stabilizer. Okay vertical stabilizer and rudder. So now that's what we're gonna do next, the same exact sequence. Okay, see, I'm like a little bit too far. If I were to hook that up, it'd push this rudder over. So I wanna turn this, I'm just grabbing this with two fingers or three fingers and bending it a little bit so that it bites and then when I spin this, it goes in instead of just spinning the whole rod and undoing it at the other end. Okay, so that was like three or four turns. Oh, that's pretty darn close. I think I overshot by half a turn at least. I'm just kind of lining up this little pin with that hole. Is that pretty close? Mm, I still think you need to go a half maybe back. Okay, like this. Okay, that looks pretty good. Sure. Now I'm gonna slide this gas tube, it's a fuel tube, and I'm just gonna open that back up. This is one of those points where if you get an inferior plane, which by the way, I'm not trying to beat you up for having um, you know, different budget levels. We review all sorts of different budget level planes. But I want you to have a great experience so you keep coming back learning to fly, advancing, and doing a good job of it. Okay, so we didn't bind, we didn't pay any attention to these switches, okay? But this one we did, why? Because that is throttle cut. It prevents you from accidentally cutting yourself by leaning in front of this and then starting the prop. So I'm gonna shut off throttle cut. Okay, so you see, that's why you have a throttle cut because it's very easy to bump into that throttle cut. Okay, very important safety feature. It's one of the few safety features that I really talk about on this channel because I believe in it. It's so easy to do and there's really no excuse to not use it, okay? So now that we've given throttle, AS3X is live. AS3X will correct. If you look at the rudder, when I slide it over this way, you'll see it's gonna go that way. See how it goes that way? Now when I bring it back to the camera crew, it's gonna go towards you. See that? Now it goes away from you. Now it goes towards you. That's because the environmental impact on the plane is not from the sticks. Now, I can move the stick, and then the AS3X will also help correct some, but it knows the difference between me moving and something pushing it, okay, like wind. See this? See the air on? Up, down. Oh, I'm in safe. How do you know you're in safe? Trying to find the quickest route to level. 
So that's going to roll the plane until it gets about level. See how we're kind of cockeyed, cattywampus there? That, we, we want that to be straight too. I'm just going to look at that for a second. Okay, so that looks a lot better now. And you'll notice that the aileron over here is down just a hair. I think I'm going to fix that too. I'll show you how to do that right now. Okay. So the way we fix that is first we have to get out of safe. So there's one of these switches that takes us out of safe. So we must be an experienced intermediate or uh, that's basic or excuse me, beginner. So that's going to put safe on. Then this is intermediate. So it's going to take away auto leveling, but it's going to still limit your bank angles. And then this is experience. So it's not going to auto level. How do you know if you're an experienced? If you turn it upside down, it doesn't try to find the quickest route. When you're in safe, it tries to find the quickest route to level. It's easy to test that on the ailerons. Okay. So throttle cuts on just looking at this to see if it's level, looking at this to see if it's level. It looks like this one needs to go, uh, well, in this case, it'd be down a little bit, which is actually up because we have the plane upside down. Okay, so I'm just gonna turn it in like two turns. Now, as you get more experience, you can actually put those into the uh, next holes. So oh, I think I went the wrong way. There's two, three, four, okay. You can go to the closer to the inside holes and that will give more control authority to you. It'll also make your AS3X more powerful in the overall equation of control. And so you have to be aware that if you go to the inside holes on some of these, what might happen is as you're flying at high rates of speed, the plane may overcorrect and it'll oscillate or it'll oscillate or it'll oscillate as it's flying. It looks weird and you'll know exactly what it is now that I've talked about it. That oscillation can be corrected two ways. You can either slow down the plane or you can put those control horns out like one step on whatever control axis. Now, if you have a more sophisticated aircraft like this, you can change the settings and fix that. Okay, so as you look outside, you'll see the sun is about to crest over the hill and we want to show this thing flying right now. So we're gonna pause and come right back. Okay, so the center of gravity can be indicated by using a tape measure. In this case, we have a tape. It says on page 12 here, this is talking about the low voltage cutoff. We talked about that if your battery gets low, but then down below, it talks about the center of gravity verification. So you want you to go three, inches back or 75 millimeters. Now we usually use calipers because we do this a lot, but if you don't have calipers, you can also just use a tape measure to measure three inches. So just so you guys can see, that's going to be the same measurement, three inches. Okay. So how do you mark the CG? First of all, my plane is energized. We've tested the throttle cut to make sure it's working. I'm going to flip the plane upside down in this case, and I'm just going to measure. It's super duper easy. There may already be, oh, look at that. It's the wing spar. It's already at three inches. So you don't even have to mark this plane. Now, why is that true? Because many times the structure of the wing is going to be thickest at the center of gravity. That's not always true, but generally as a rule of thumb, two thirds back, you'll notice this one's almost halfway back. This is like, I would say that that is really more like two fifths of the way back. That's fine. It doesn't really matter in this case. All you do to test the CG is you hold the plane with the wheels down in this case, and you see how it balances on my fingertips. A nose heavy plane is going to tend to fall off your fingers this way, and a tail heavy plane is going to tend to lean back or fall off your fingers that way. This plane is not going to care between a 2200 or a 1300 milliamp hour battery. It's going to fly on either one. So we're going to pause, go out, try to fly in this beautiful sunset, and then you guys will be seeing it in reverse order. But if you haven't already bought this Apprentice S in the 1.2 meter, ready to fly configuration, we really highly encourage you to consider it as a first plane. We have reviewed this plane before, we know it's good. It's very fun, it's very capable, you'll love it. It will help you to learn to fly. There is a lot of learning involved, so don't get discouraged, just practice a lot, fly as often as you can. And if you don't like this plane and you wanna look at some other beginners, ask us, we'll put a link for all the different beginner planes that we typically recommend and you can sort between those. I love the tricycle landing gear. These big landing gear will work good in grass. Highly recommend it. You'll be helping support us if you buy from the links below. Small commission comes from Horizon Hobby instead of you paying us. If you wanna pay us, you can. We have a Patreon site if you'd like to support us in that way or you can do PayPal if you wanna do a one-time gift. 
as a thank you rather than buying the planes. Either way, it doesn't matter to us. We just want you guys to learn to fly and come back for more. We know that you're gonna love it so much that soon enough you'll be flying a plane like this or bigger or more exciting even still. I love that plane, it is amazing and it will do just about everything you can do in RC aviation. But just to be clear, this plane is great. It is well built, it is economical as a ready to fly and if you've already got a transmitter, you can get it as a bind and fly, which is a great option if you've got kids that wanna fly and you can just share your transmitter. So guys, without further ado, please do come back for more. YouTube, it's Brian Phillips. We've got the Apprentice 1.2. This thing is awesome. This used to be known as the Mini. Now it's not. It's just the Apprentice S2. It is version two. It comes with an AR631. It's got all smart stuff. It's got all sorts of cool things on it. It doesn't have an ADN ESC, so don't get too worried. You're not gonna have to worry about thrust reverser flaps or any of that stuff. But this thing is great. We're gonna fly it right now. It's on the included 1300 3S smart pack. It's a Gen 1, comes with the charger and everything throttle cuts off. We're in experience mode right now, but we're gonna do beginner mode right now. I haven't even trimmed it, and look at that, it's already flying. Okay, chop the throttle, give it a little bit of roll. We are in beginner mode. I'm just gonna hold the stick, and I'm just gonna show you just how easy this is, guys. Look at this. I barely even touched anything, and look at this, guys. It's already back on the ground and at our feet, okay? Now, you guys, don't believe me, that just happened, okay? So, now I'm gonna go to experience and show you what it can really do. I love flying the Apprentice. It is so much fun. It is a great flying plane. It is so well behaved. It is so much fun. Let's go about four steps forward. I mean, I can still fit, but. Just to give you guys an idea, this plane is a 1.2 meter platform, and yes, it is a beginner plane and it will do everything you basically want to do. It just won't do it maybe like insanely, okay? Okay, need a little bit of down elevator trim. Now, one difference we did in setup that you wouldn't have to do is I set up on the inside hole for the rudder and elevator. If you're a new pilot, you're gonna to wanna to go to the outside hole and then work your way in until you're satisfied with where you need to be. A Little bit of rudder there. We're about 20% throttle, just so you know, and I'm not 100% sure of this, but there's four bright LED lights here. Whoa. Did you see what was happening there? Mm -hmm. Got about 15% up on the elevator here. We got a little bit of a twitch on our, our rudder trying to figure out what might have been causing it, if anything, or if it was just in my head. Pretty sure it wasn't just in my head. There it goes again. As you can see, it does everything you could want to do. It's not unlimited amounts of power, but it's got plenty to do what you're gonna wanna do. I think we might be experiencing a little bit of uh, interference, maybe. See how it does not have unlimited vertical? That's pretty much your limitation on this plane. See that? Mm -hmm. 
So let's try some touch and goes. If you want to come forward a little bit, please. Okay, so we're going to bring it down the runway. Now I'm in experienced mode, so you can flare and just really, really, really get it where you need it. Okay. But the thing is, if you're in beginner mode, I'm going to show you, this is the beginner mode. Okay. Pulling back on the stick, about 50% throttle. Just kind of giving it a suggestion with my finger here to go into a circle. I'm going to give it a suggestion the other way now. Pulling back on the stick to make it a little quicker. And then just rolling out straight. Now, I'm gonna go out past the lines and then down and under. Okay, I'm out of the throttle. This thing will glide for a long ways. Just kind of gliding it around. I'm using a little bit of rudder, pointing it down with my sticks, bringing it under, giving it a little bit of a turn to the left, and then I can flare it in safe as well. And you see the center of gravity is just absolutely perfect with this 1300 3S. Super, super easy to fly. The only thing I'm not sure about is we have a weird flutter on the rudder. So now I just got to figure out why that's happening. Rudder's working great. Now, if you had it in the outside hole, you wouldn't even probably notice it, but I have it on the inside, or excuse me, I have it on the inside hole so that I have extra authority so I can make more aggressive maneuvers. So if you're new to flying, you'd want to put it in the outside hole for sure. Let's see if it'll do grass. Yep, it'll do grass. Our grass is cut at three and a quarter to three and a half inches. We just had about 400 inches of rain last night. So it's probably grown like half its height since last night. Do a stall turn here. Panic. That's pressing this button. I want you to note that when you press panic, it stays in panic mode for a second or two. I'm going to demonstrate it here. 50% throttle, panic. When you let go, you can still go, but it's limited. Panic. As soon as you let go, it takes a few seconds. You'll notice it yanked down. That was because I was holding the stick. Panic. Now, instead of using panic so that you don't have that issue, you can just flip into beginner mode. If you're going between beginner mode and advanced mode, then just skip the intermediate stage. I really load the intermediate stage because all it does is limit your bank angles, but then it doesn't automatically level the plane. So in my opinion, it's not a, it's not a very great way to teach somebody how to fly because you're just gonna limit their ability to correct and get out of a, a terrible situation. So there's intermediate. See, it limits your bank angle. And then it limits your bank angle. See how it limits? It's got that really like strange spot where it stops, but it doesn't correct your rudder, okay? So then same thing here. It won't let you go over and it won't let you go over. You see that? Hup, except it did. Okay, so now I'm in safe. And you wanna know why it did? because we went to the outside hole, or instead of going to the outside hole, we went to the inside mm. hole, which means that we were better able to overwhelm the, the system. Okay, so we're in experienced mode again, all the way toward us on that uh, stick B. I just wanna show you guys, this thing will fly forever, but you can slip, you can slip the plane, that's where you use ailerons and rudder in opposite configuration to kind of bring the plane in and slow it down. So I'm gonna roll down into this bull area and I'm gonna get up to altitude a little bit and I'm gonna chop the throttle here a little bit high. I'm gonna roll and slip and then pull up at the last second. Very easy way to get that thing to do what you need to do. Slipping is a very nice tool when you don't have access to flaps. Flaps, of course, are inboard. They look like ailerons, but they both go down and they change the angle of attack. They increase drag. 
and they reduce the stall speed. This plane is so fun to fly and it is so easy to fly. I'm absolutely loving it. Camera crew, do you wanna try it? She's giving me the look, like she's really desperately wants to fly. No? Yes, let's do it. Okay, so the camera crew is gonna take the controls. See this? We're down to two, so there is active telemetry coming from the smart pack. Okay, so the camera crew is gonna fly. Hold on. Are you ready? No. She's getting mentally prepared. Look at her <laughs> mentally getting prepared. She's like, no, I don't want to film. All right, so here's what you're gonna do. But the problem is, I don't, I don't land. Well, that's fine. Just, just give it like full throttle and pull back on the stick. You ready? Okay. No. She's, she's looking around okay. to see if there's any owls. I, I know. I'm waiting for someone to rescue me. That's fine. I'll rescue you. Okay. Pull back all the way. Full throttle. Oh, full no, throttle. Please. Full throttle. Full throttle. Thank you. Just keep flying. Don't worry about it. Okay. Now turn it over here. Am I in safe? Yes. Okay. Okay. Now just keep going up high. You're going to be fine. You'll notice a market de-improvement <laughs> in these filming here oh, and flying and uh the flying will be a little bit different now turn to your left so you I'll want to go the other left. way there you go so you're just gonna move the stick over there now turn a little bit sharper so you, you know it can stay in the county okay now just chop your throttle that means put it all the way down on that it's stick all the way down okay and then it's what you're going to do is you're just going to turn it turn it toward us turn it harder now there line up and just try to do you think, okay, give yep. it more throttle and go up. Okay, go up higher so that you're over the trees. See, she's filming, she's flying. Okay, now you're just gonna try the same thing. Do you wanna go under the power lines this time? Mm, no, but I'm gonna go down further, like towards the driveway. Yeah, that's fine. But just remember, you don't have unlimited range here. Yeah. Okay, so cut your throttle. You got lots of energy to use. Okay. You can pump up and down. That'll uh, whoops, 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 whoops. pull up. Okay, just try again. Remember, you can always go around until you can't. <laughs> Keep Great. flying. You see this, guys? As she's flying, that goes to one dot. It's going to go to one flashing dot shortly. And then the pressure is really <laughs> on. Thanks. So this is this is a true beginner experience, guys. Megan is first of all, she is not a lifelong hobbyist. If you get into trouble, just go full throttle. Now just wiggle back and forth a little bit. There you go. Now just no throttle and just put it down. Right now. There you go. Come on. Good job. I mean, granted, that's tall grass. She did it. Her heart attack is over. All right, we have a deal. And the deal is <laughs> now that I've made her fly off the cuff, throttle cuts on, safety first. Um, now I'll pay for that later, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Maybe she'll make me make dinner. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna go get the plane out of the tall grass. Let's show the people how tall this grass is. So as you can see, that plane is in one piece. Now, there's two things to keep in mind. One, the Air 631 is, is new in this configuration in this plane. They used to have a different safe receiver. I don't know if they did the Air 630, I think they did the 636B um, toward the end before they discontinued and then overhauled it. But either way, I love the plane. I'm a little bit weirded out by the rudder. I'm not sure what's going on with that. And I know that she had an issue with it because uh, she was freaking out. See this? It's uh, a little juicy around here because oh, we got is. so much rain. I'm going to show you guys a hand launch. Okay, so the, the plane is down. Throttle cut's already been tested. Okay, absolutely no problems. I'm going to shut off the throttle cut with my mouth. I know it's kind of weird. Okay, I'm in safe technically, but I'm going to come out of safe because I'd rather have it off. Okay. Just so you can see, it can be done. It's definitely a more challenging uh, plane to launch out of safe, but you can definitely do it. I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna come around, do a couple of slow passes, close proximity slow passes for beauty reasons, because I love flying this plane. It's one of these planes that, you know, I've got a couple of apprentices in our basement. Our basement dungeon is full of planes. Like it's insane how many planes are down there. And I love flying them, pretty much all. Some more than others. But this plane is one of those planes where every time I fly it, I'm like, why don't I get my other apprentices out? I've added flaps on a big apprentice, an apprentice 1.5. This is an apprentice 1.2, so it's the little brother. 
This thing is very, very well behaved. And just absolutely love the way it's flying. It's also quite calm right now, full disclosure, folks. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to mislead it all. Let's go down by the flag here. By the way, John, we haven't thanked you for this flag. Grumpy John is one of our subscribers and long, long time subscriber and supporters. And uh, he sends us the flag that you see right behind the plane. That flag is so nice because we've used a bunch of different flags over the years and he sends the best flags. <laughs> he just, he's just a nice guy and he wants to support us. Plus he has pigs. And uh, what else does John do? John does all sorts of cool things and he's just, he's just been around forever. So we appreciate you, John. If you're watching this, I'm sure, which I'm sure you will. So we, we really do. This plane is just a joy to fly. And it's just the type of thing you can throw up there and you don't have to have a bunch of cares. It's not like you're like, hey, how do I get the thrust reverse on? And what do I do for pilot fatigue? And what do I do when the EDF, you know, eats all the juice up? Let's show the people the flashing light here. Oh, yep. See, when I'm flying, because I am uh, being quite conservative with the throttle, it's actually gone between one and one flashing, which means that you're actually between uh, 25 and 50% power. And when there's two lights on, you're at more or less between, uh, what it, would that be like 33 and 66%? Mm. And then when you're at three, you'd be between 50 and 75%. And when you're at four, you're at 100%. Three, one flashing, that means you're somewhere between 175. So just basically think of it like when the lights are off, see the rudder did it. Did you see it? Mm -hmm. So I think what's going on would not even be noticeable if we were in the outside hole, but we put it in the inside hole for extra control authority. And so I'd really like to investigate what's going on. But for now, I just love flying it too much to screw around with it. And then for those of you guys that are gonna come up with some conspiracy theory about the rudder, I actually have no clue What's causing that? I wanted to just get right down there on top of that grass. <coughs> Touch and go, <laughs> Brian Phillips RC style. Hey, I didn't land it better than that. Well, I mean, you weren't maybe pushing the envelope quite like I was. Whatever. Man, that is so beautiful tonight. Yeah, it's super nice out. Last night we had like serious thunderstorms come through. Yes. And, uh, well, it's kind of awkward when the rudder does that. Mm -hmm. A little bit. That's me trying to cornhole it, but then the rudder got all excited about it. There we go. Cornhole for everybody. So you guys are always asking how to do the cornhole. Let's just show the people. Okay. Throttle up and then all the way up like that. Okay. So both sticks up and left. And then you just alternate the direction. So like this, and then you can, uh, with a more capable plane, I would, have been, I would have been able to continue that. So basically what I'm doing is I'm just riding the line between um, watching what's going on with the rudder and uh, just countering it with the ailerons, okay? I love the, you can just ride it on the mains, no problem. All right, let's talk about this a little bit more. Let's go up close and see what's, see what's maybe causing our, our issue on the rudder. If, this, if you're a new pilot and you're seeing that, um, it's, it's kind of one of those weird nuances that we get in this hobby. Sometimes there's problems and you don't know what it is until you investigate. And so I'm not sure if maybe we've got a wire wrapped up around it. We've already tested the throttle cut, so let's test that again, okay? So the rudder occasionally is getting into a weird condition where it's wanting to kind of jank off to one side or the other. So if this was in the outside hole, then that would be lesser noticed, but it's still a factor. So let's take a look inside here. If you guys stay tuned, you can watch our full 
uh, build and radio setup. Radio setup is about 10 seconds because you mm -hmm. pretty much powered up. These things come pre-bound if it's in a ready to fly configuration, which is what this one was uh, sent like. And if you get it as a bind and fly, we didn't even do a bind, but it should be pretty simple stuff. Okay, so let's just pull this wing out. And what I'd like to do is I would like to just look inside of here and see if there's anything that would lead me to believe that we have like maybe a bad servo or, you know, like the antenna's in a weird position. I'm pulling the antenna out. Okay, just looking it over. I don't really see anything too bad. I got that uh, blood sucker and just squished him. That was awesome. I'm gonna actually put this antenna in a slightly different spot. I don't think that's our issue here. Um, the other thing too is we have some additional channels on this trans or receiver here that I could maybe tap into as well. But I'm curious what's going on with our rudder servo. So I'm gonna just pull that wire out of our little channel that we put in there. Just kind of tug on the wire, see if anything happens. Yank on it like this. Okay, so I'm actually gonna unplug my whole Y cable for the ailerons, okay? And I'm gonna do something a little bit weird. I'm gonna take and shut the throttle cut off, pull this rubber band off. I'm just gonna taxi it around a little bit without the wing on. <laughs> Looks kind of funny. It's like a little fish. Yeah, it's the fish car. So I'm just trying to simulate a couple of different things. One thing I'm gonna do is turn around. Okay, so I've got, I think I'm gonna taxi it back to us. There is actually a way to do a range test on this setup. But I don't know what it is. I would have to look it up. So obviously that's moving. And it seems to be moving okay, but there's a little bit of a bind that's happening there. So that's maybe not so good. See that? Where it's hitting? That could be a bit of an issue, but I don't think that's it. These are 13 gram servos. I'm just going to give it some throttle. And then I'm going to give it some ailerons. The ailerons aren't even hooked up. You see what just happened there? Look. I hit my throttle cup. Oh. So I'm not sure what the deal is. I think we gotta look into this a little bit more and come right back. Okay, so we're losing light here, but it's okay, because that's why you come to Brian Phillips RC is because we solve problems, we don't just uh, hide them. So this model is comes with a DXS, okay? So the DXS is uh, simple, you know, it's not got a lot of frills transmitter, but it is actually quite capable for a no frills transmitter. One of the frills that may not seem like a very good one is range test. You can set up range test and range test is used to check the status of your radio. Now I would like to keep the same battery in this plane and put the wing back on so we can do the range test and I want to show you what happens for a range test, what its function is and how to do it. Okay so a range test cuts the power from that transmitter and it will help you to establish whether or not you have um, an issue with your receiver or your transmitter. Now I don't believe we have an issue with the receiver or transmitter. I think maybe there's a little something going on with our servo, but I'm not sure on that. And so in this case, I'm just going to assume that the problem is with the range of the transmitter. And so I'm gonna take this and put this back together. Throttle cuts on, everything has been tested. It's very easy to take this wing off, but I'm still just gonna throw this back together real quick. The big thing is if you have a range issue with your transmitter, then the best thing you can do is resolve the range issue, whether that means replacing the transmitter, talking to Horizon, uh, getting their input, or distinguishing between that and a bad servo, um, it would be helpful to be able to call and tell them about that and say, hey, we think we've got maybe a bad servo or we think we've maybe got a bad transmitter and this is why. And then you can tell them what you, you did to figure it out, okay? So it's always important to have good feedback for the tech support if you do have to call. 
So first things first, everything is hooked up, rudder, ailerons, elevator, okay? Throttle cuts off, throttle, throttle's cut is on. And the way you execute a range test is basically you press and hold the bind button and then you move switch F, which is over here, four times within 10 seconds, okay? So regardless of your condition, okay, so one, two, three, four. Now it's in range test mode. Okay, so range test mode, the best way to test is to have somebody hold your plane in a safe spot so that you can run all the different channels you wanna test. Now, you can run throttles, so be careful. I'm gonna shut go, I'm gonna let go of this, shut it off. As soon as you shut it off, it goes to full power. So we're gonna demonstrate this now and we'll come right back and show it outside. Okay, so due to the limitations of our mic equipment, it's possible that my audio will cut out. Camera crew is going to try to replicate what I'm saying. She'll be the one holding the plane so you can see what's happening. We need to be 28 meters or about 90 feet apart. And we're gonna simulate that by just walking over to the end of the driveway there. Remember, whatever distance you go, figure on having 10 times that because you have caught the power by 10 times. Okay, so if your issue, there's, there's another trick if you're alone and it's not something that's maybe ideal, and so you need to be a little bit careful doing this. This is a small plane. I'm comfortable with the environment. I know there's not anybody around. So throttle cuts off. I'm out of safe. Pressing and holding the binding. One, two, three, four. Range test starts. Either on roll left, roll right. Elevator up, down. Roll left, roll right with the rudder. See how everything else is moving less. Did you see that? Did you see it? It tripped. So I'm basically just walking away from us. And as soon as I let go, I'm gonna go to full throttle, okay? So this range test, I'm doing a terrible job of it because normally you wanna be very consistent on your controls so you can see what's going on. But I'm trying to do this in such a way that we can still be heard audibly because we're gonna lose signal on our radios for our mics if I walk all the way down there, I fear. I can watch. Okay, so I think that's pretty close to 90 feet. So I'm gonna cut the throttle. Now I'm just gonna move the controls and you can see the controls are all moving just fine. Everything is working. So it's not a range issue. Okay, now I've out, I'm out of that mode. I'm too lazy to go pick that plane up. So I'm just gonna fly it back. So just to let you guys know, that rudder, has been doing that where it will tweak over to the side. So my expectation is we probably have a little something going on with the rudder. So we're gonna continue, we'll pause and show you what we're doing. For the sake of time, I'm gonna lay the transmitter down and I'm gonna do this right here. I'm gonna take this collar back or this uh, little rubber hose thing, pull this back. I'm gonna unclip this from the inside most hole. That's the way I set it up for extra throw. And I'm actually just gonna put it to the outside most hole. I wanna see to what degree the impact will be. Gosh, all this rhyming tonight. <laughs> I wanna see to what degree the impact will be on the rudder when we do this. Okay, so uh, I don't wanna cut the grass anymore, so we'll just put it up on the uh, taxiway here. Camera crew, you good? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the rudder is now hooked up in the outside, and I doubt that this is gonna have any impact, so we'll just go ahead and throttle it, give it a nice roll. Oh, beautiful. I'm gonna go up a little higher for exposure reasons. Okay, so I'm rolling a little bit to the right. Need a little bit of trim back, a little bit of trim to the left. I am janking it so I can keep visibility. Okay, here we go. So it's rolling a little bit to the right using the ailerons and rudder a little bit. Obviously less authority on the rudder than what we had before, which is exactly to be expected. A Little bit more aileron trim. Basically, I get myself going in a straight path and I look at what the plane does. Is it going straight? Yes. Is it rolling? Is it pulling up? It's up a little bit. There's down. There's a little bit more to the right until it's, okay, so now we're past. Okay, we got it now. So it's basically adjusted. So now I'm just gliding around 15% throttle, if that. 
looking at my little green light to make sure we have power, which we still do. Thank God for telemetry, it's amazing. And I can still feel, I can still feel and hear the servo tweaking on the rudder. I know it's not a range issue, so it's more than likely gonna be the rudder. The only thing I could do beyond that is to switch the rudder and aileron. You hear it there, it just did it again. So it's also possible that the transmitter has an issue, but I kind of really doubt it. And the only way to tell the difference between one issue and the other is to separate the two. And so that's what we're gonna do next. We're gonna go grab another transmitter, we'll bind it, and then we'll see if the problem persists. So guys, what we're doing here is we're teaching you to troubleshoot your airplane. Throttle cuts on. We're gonna meet you inside. Okay, so this is where it comes in pretty handy having another controller because we need another controller to do this next test. And that is, this one was set up for the Aero Scout, evidently. Apparently. Really? It must be the Aero Scout Mini. I wonder. Hmm. Well, shoot, if it is, then we'll switch it. But either way, what we're gonna do is we're basically gonna leave the battery in. We're just gonna unplug it. Now, our battery is low, so it may not bind as a result. So I'm gonna actually, now that I think of it, I probably have to take this battery out. So if I can just take this battery out. So this battery is mostly spent. We've flown it forever, okay? This battery that came with a stock charger is charged. So I'm just gonna go ahead and plug this one in here and we'll plug it in here and then you guys can see what type of battery voltage we used. Okay, so yeah, so we used quite a bit. So we're at like 19% charge, but we flew forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, the warning was about right, that's 3.8. That's about where I would wanna stop Okay, so I unplugged from the included charger, the Gen 1 Smart Pack that came with it. So we're gonna go ahead and get our bind plug. Where did that bind plug end up, camera crew? I don't know. Oh, so here's the bind plug. So what we're gonna do is we are going to turn off the transmitter in question. Then we're gonna take this transmitter and we're gonna turn it we're gonna be turning it on and pressing the bind button, okay? Throttle cut is on. So in this case, there's binding procedures that are outlined in, on this page. And this page is gonna show you all the different choices you can bind with safe select or you can bind without. But really on this plane, this is a safe equipped plane. It's full safe, not safe select. So I'm just gonna plug it in. I'm gonna feed this wire through because I don't wanna to have to redo the straps because that's one of the wonderful parts of using the same exact battery all the time on one plane is sometimes you can get away with this because I hate doing the straps. Then I'm gonna plug the plane in. I'm gonna leave it upside down in fact and then this is the one that says Aero Scout so I'll go ahead and press and hold the bind switch and turn it on. Okay, so it must be bound. Now it's dancing but we're gonna immediately flip this back over so I don't even care if it starts up, it is live. So now I'm gonna go ahead and shut this off. I'm gonna take the bind plug out, stick it in there. We saw two dances of the control surfaces, so we know that we're in safe either way. So now I'm gonna plug this in and then quickly flip the plane over and lay it on its wheels. Wait for the dance, that's when it's initiating, that's when it's determined that that's level. Elevator up, down, roll left, roll right. Okay, so everything is working, and throttle cuts off, and we got throttle. We have throttle cut, it's working, and then there's high rates and low rates here. So that's high rates, that's low rates, that's high rates, that's low rates. Okay, rudder, high rates, low rates. See, elevator, high rates and low rates, okay. So everything is working there. So now really the only thing left would be to go back out and just see how it flies and see if our rudder issue comes back. Okay, so throttle cuts off. Now remember guys, the trim that I just did was tied to the other transmitter. Bunch of trim, bunch of trim on the ailerons, jeez. 
bunch of trim to get that thing over. There we go. Okay, so now, just gliding along, not doing anything fancy. Okay, so now I'm gonna come back at us. About 30% throttle, just getting it leveled out. I think I finally have it going about straight. Okay, so now that I have it going straight, I'm in AS3X. A little bit of upward angle of attack, that's fine with me. I am using the rudder. I'm intentionally flying with that higher angle of attack so I can stay close and stay in the light. Going a little bit harder on it now. Trying a little bit of the different features. Trying to initiate the issue that we had earlier. So far, so good. Have you noticed it? I don't think so. I haven't heard it. I haven't seen it either though. It's a little bit hard to tell in the dark or near dark. So really where it kind of gets you is you're going around and then it just kind of janks the stick. So I think our problem may have been in the transmitter. As though the stick had been actuated to the one side. But I'd really like to run this test for a little while longer, just do a couple figure eights. Watch out for the building, of course. But as you can see, I'm doing knife edges. Was that you? I think it was me. Because okay. I actually had to correct. We'll try some more high throttle. I'm trying to not use the rudder. Kind of bank and yank right now. That's full throttle, by the way. This is why the camera crew is so good. Because look at the ridiculous situations I put you in. <laughs> A little bit of down trim. Don't worry, we have life insurance people. By the way, guys, that was just a hilarious joke. If you don't get it, <laughs> I think you're looking for the RC sailors. <laughs> Camera crew, I'm like legit thinking that we got it. I have not noticed the, the symptom at all the whole time. And I mean, we noticed it pretty much right away. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna try some different things. I'm gonna go up here, go into safe, and I'm just gonna loiter with the ailerons, okay? So I know that it's in a safe configuration. And I'm gonna listen, okay? See what I'm doing? I'm blocking the signal. Mm. I'm obstructing it, okay? Now I'm gonna go in front of this pull, this column. I'm intentionally blocking the signal as much as possible, and it's not changing the condition at all. Did you hear it? Mm -mm. Okay. I haven't heard it at all. The bug zapper doesn't really help with that test. Okay, so out of safe. I think we found the problem. Not quite enough power. Was that a bat? Is that a bat? You see that bat? Right there next to the house? Don't chase it, we want them. No, I know. We really do. We have two bat houses we put up at this property and uh, neither of them seem to have yielded any bats. 
Probably because neither of them followed the instructions quite right. And that's because the instructions were impossible. And I'm not going to put a light pole in the middle of my yard for no reason. Up. And down. Guys, this thing is flying pretty perfect now. I would say it's time to put the uh, elevator hole back in. You good with that? The elevator hole? Yeah. I just want to walk out here so I have a little bit more room. Okay, so we're going to stick the rudder control arm back in where it was before because that's going to exaggerate the effect if it happens. Okay? So... This is troubleshooting 101, guys. Split the system in half until you identify where the problem is. In our case, I had three different components that could be at fault. Oh, hey. You see the light? I can see what you're doing. Oh my goodness, look at that trim. Oh man. You see where it is now? When I was out there? I need to trim that so much. Um, I'm just gonna screw that in a few times. And then I'm gonna take my rudder Wow. That was a lot. That was a lot of trim. Okay, so there's where I need to put it. Okay, so that's centered. It doesn't mean it's right. It just means it's centered. Uh, maybe one more out. So guys, this video is long. I mean, we don't really do it any other way. Um, but the reason we show you this stuff is not because we're trying to beat up on any one particular brand, plane, or whatever. We just want to teach you how to do this stuff, okay? All right, so throttle cuts out. Was that it or was that you? No, it was me. Okay. When I'm turning on a sharp bank like that, I have to use rudder a lot. There's a little bit coming right there. You can see it in the way I'm flying. Like it's obvious when I do it or when it happens because I have to correct. You guys see, I'm not having problems. I'm just flying real tight quarters. We don't have flaps on this plane. It's not like I can go super, super slow. I don't know if that was it or not. If that was it, it's extremely subtle. Could just be a trimming issue. How's your lighting? Terrible. Okay, so I think we're still good. Hey, can you hit my elbow, my left elbow? Up. There you go, got it, thank you. I'm sure they got a good feast by the time you got that. Sorry. That's all right, you did a good job. I mean, seriously, the ridiculous things that I put my wife through to film for this channel. Guys, I, I can't say that I haven't seen it even one time, but I can say that I was seeing it a ton before. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it was a lot. So I'm thinking it's probably in the DXS and it could be on the gimbal. So, you know what's next? Throttle cuts on. The camera crew just rolled her eyes viciously at me. Okay, so throttle cut is on. We're going inside. Okay, so we figured this out so that hopefully you don't have to. Uh, first of all, we found a failure. Of course, as we start our video, the cats decide to attack the box. Yes. They've been quiet the whole time, but now that we're filming. Um, okay, so you'll note that everything is bound back to the in-question transmitter. We have the 
uh, rudder set to the inside hole so that there's maximum change. Really, all we're looking for is a noise when we're not moving the stick. Okay, so just to confirm, see, it actually did it just then. So, moving the throttle, we have throttle cut on, it's, it's tested. There's the rudder, it moves, it's got good precision, everything is fine, but watch this, watch the throttle stick. Okay, nothing, 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 right? Right. Okay, so now watch this, I'm just gonna go back and forth. Just real small movements right around the 50% point. Okay, that's where I discovered that there was a bit of a problem, okay? So now the stick is down and it doesn't matter. Inside the transmitter, this is what it looks like. I've got it open, but I have it connected so I can run it. I'm gonna turn the flash on. Okay, see. fine. Okay, so now I want you to keep, hey, quiet over there, cats. I can't turn the flash on the better, it's too low. Okay, so you see this? You hear that? Mm -hmm. Can you point the camera see. so they can see both? Okay, now I'm not manipulating the rudder. You hear it? So just this subtle movement in the connector down here. I want you to see what's going on. When I, when I move that connector, you see what's happening? The rudder is moving. Now, if I do the same condition over here to the ailerons, we don't have the same symptom, okay? You see, nothing. Nothing. We have a legitimate problem, and the problem is either in this cable, in this pot, which I doubt it, underneath the, the goop that is around this landing on that, on that potentiometer right there. See, I'm moving it, it works, but I think it's more than likely in that connector right there. Because like you can see, just by moving that connector, when you, see it, mm -hmm. there it goes. That's the symptom we're trying to replicate. So. What I can tell you is that the nature of the position of this switch is such that as it moves into the mid range, which is where you fly this plane, like 40, 50% throttle all the time. Look at that. You see what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. That is not me. Look how much I'm moving the stick. I'm moving it 1%. Mm -hmm. So I found the sweet spot and I replicated the problem. Now that I've replicated the problem, we know that it's either in this transmitter right there or it's in the potentiometer right there. My guess is it's probably in the transmitter. So the transmitter is defective. So why do we show you this? Because we care about our audience and our audience cares about planes. And Horizon cares about their audience, our audience, because they wanna make things like this better. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna report the problem. And in the meantime, we have plenty of ready to fly transmitters lying around, but we also have a bind and fly. The interesting part is even with that problem, the camera crew flew it, mm -hmm. didn't crash, but I almost crashed a couple of times because I read the line. Um, so I just want you guys to see, you know, we run into weird situations too. You know, it's not the first or last time I'm gonna see a problem. Horizon is one of the best companies to work with they will make this right, I promise you. Now, how does that look for us as influencers that happen to work with Horizon? The way it looks for us is they let us publish a video like this and you get to see the screw up they made, which is not exactly good marketing. But let's be honest, we're here to bring products to you, but really we're here to bring solutions, how to, how to set up the radio, how to deal with batteries, how to replace props, how to balance props, you know, how to fix a plane after you crashed it. These are not necessarily things that are good from a perspective of Horizon Hobby or Banggood or, you know, Bico Hobby or Dynam or whatever it happens to be. They want their things to be cast in as positive a light as possible. And that's what any brand marketing manager is gonna want. We bring you guys the real no BS story. We show it the way it is so that you understand what you could be getting into. I can tell you this from experience. We've had what, like six or seven of these DXSs? Yeah, at least this happens to be the first one we've ever had a problem with. Mm -hmm. So is it in the solder joint on the board or is it on the cable com coming up? I tend to think it's in the cable coming up. So replacing the gimbal would fix that problem. Now, are they gonna make you do that? No, they're just gonna send a replacement transmitter. The good news is under normal circumstances with this rudder hole in the inside, 
you'd be able to fly this plane all day long. It would just be kind of annoying. There'd be occasions where it would jank to one side or the other, and uh, it would be totally doable. Now, do I want to put my son on that when he's you know, still learning to fly? Do I want to put a, a brand new pilot on it? No, I want them to have the best possible situation. So is it disappointing to see a failure like this? Absolutely, it's disappointing to everybody involved. But we want you guys to know that when you come here, we show you the whole story and not just part of it. Now, if I crash a plane that's brand new, you know, we might be a little bit embarrassed, but we still try to show it to you. So without further ado, this plane is done. We're gonna show you some flying with our, uh, probably with myself, my son, um, and then maybe the camera crew again. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna bind it up to just another transmitter that doesn't happen to have that problem. We're gonna mark this as such. And uh, the other day, a few months ago, I dropped my NX-8 on the ground and I broke the, an I broke the antenna opening and I broke this switch off. And I replaced all that stuff, which I stole from a simulator. And so what I'll probably do is I will take the switch off of this and use it to make whole <laughs> the simulator transmitter. Because the throttle hold is not intact on that one, but you don't need a throttle cut um, when you're doing you know, a simulator because safety isn't, isn't necessarily as critical when it's fake. <laughs> um, but anyway, guys, without further ado, this is a super long video. I hope you've learned something new um, by the way, there were six screws that opened this cabinet. We weren't going to bore you with that, but there were six screws. We used the same screwdriver we used to build this plane, and we undid all six of them. Two of them didn't want to kind of, you know, come out of the holder, but we were still able to open this. And uh, yes, you'll want to be super duper careful about opening up cabinets like this. They're not typically considered to be a user serviceable item that I understand, um, but I happen to... Uh, work on industrial electronics for a living and I don't really care because I'm gonna fix the problem. That's what I do <laughs> Yes, regardless of what that's my wife tells me break things because I can fix them That's right. <laughs> All right guys without further ado. I love the plane. The plane is actually perfect We just happen to have an issue with one problem. I believe it's the ground wire on One axis of the control which is unfortunate, but like I said horizons the horizons the way to go if you bought this from some of their competitors, they'd be like, well, better luck next time. They're gonna make this right. Guys, check the link in the description. You saw how good this thing flew. Even with the problem we had, I love this plane. I still love it. I have one downstairs that I've loved. It's been great. My son loves flying it. It's a good plane for a beginner. It's very manageable, even with this weird problem. This weird problem is just that, weird. It's not something we've seen before. That's why I had to tear it apart. However, I take that back now. There's one helicopter in there that came from XK. We had a similar problem with the gimbal. I had to re-solder the gimbal. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I fixed it on camera. And guess what? What do we have? 150,000 views on that thing? And it's ridiculously long and tedious. And that's part of why people come to Brian Phillips RC is for long, tedious, frustrating, <laughs> irritating videos. But guess what? It's not you being frustrated. It's me being frustrated. So if you get some sick joy out of watching me be frustrated, Thanks. come back for more. Okay, so we're not mic'ing up for this. We just wanted to show you how we resolved our problem. Um, it's 100% tested now. I am fully confident. Uh, as mentioned in a previous video, I already stole uh, the H uh, switch off of this when I dropped my NX-8 and broke the uh, a switch, which is the landing gear switch, and so I was able to steal it off of here. Well, we just stole another one off of here. This is the one we used on our simulator. Um, so what I did was I basically took the gimbal out. I marked it as such. Bad rudder pot or cable. So I don't know if the pot was the problem, the solder joint on this pot, or if it was actually the connection point here. I tend to think it was here, and that would be really hard for me to fix because I can't build that end. I don't have any mechanism to build that end. I can re-solder the pot here. I can replace this cable if I can find one. That is just goop, by the way, that was used to lock it in place right there, okay? But the point is, I know that it's the wire or that it was a receiver on here, but I don't think it was the main board on here because when I pulled the wire and I articulated the wire into just a certain spot, it would freak out. So I could strip these wires back and there's probably a broken contact somewhere. But it doesn't matter. I have a bunch of them, so I'm just gonna take the gimbal out. Now you can see it moves perfect. 
exactly where I need it. There's no problems. The throttle cut's obviously on because I'm using the throttle stick. See through the range. What would happen before is you'd get right in the middle of the stick. You'd find this sweet spot, which is just incidentally about where I normally cruise around, and it would just Except it was worse than that, actually. It was, even, it was like, instead of being like that, it was like 110% output. So we, we lucked out. We were able to identify the problem. We fixed the problem using scavenger parts from otherwise good, proven good um, transmitter. And we should be up and flying in, I say no time, but actually this took some time. But the point is, Horizon's going to make it right. If you guys buy a plane like this, they're probably just gonna send you a new DXS and be done with it and all you have to do is bind it. It'll take you like two minutes to do that. But if you're on a desert island and it takes like 17 weeks to get the transmitter, <laughs> maybe you can copy our steps and fix your own. Or if you're well out of warranty or you broke it or whatever, this is another way to do the diagnostic steps, to troubleshoot, to figure out what's going on in an otherwise quite complicated system. Make no mistake, these ready to fly planes are not simple. They are complicated and there is about a hundred different points of failure. So all you have to do is just work through the points, use uh, a little bit of common sense, try to split the system down to where you get closer and closer to where you know where the problem is, where it's replaceable. Or if you didn't have this to replace, you could go even further and you could say, was it the cable? Was it the black cable? Was it the yellow orange cable? Was it the red cable? Was it the connector? Was it the the contact point here, was it the contact point here? Was it the goop? Was it the way it was pulling on the cable? And you could go all the way down to the point where you find the actual component that failed on here, which could be as simple as the actual trim pot has a failure. I think the solder joint here or the cable failed. So we could cut this cable, you know, uh, a little bit back, re-splice it, put a new cable on and you're ready to rock and roll. And then you'll never have that problem come back again. The key is, split the system in half, reassess, split the system in half, reassess, and then try to get replicable symptoms. Bring the symptom back by putting the bad component back into the circuit. Repeat the symptom, and then you can be with confidence able to replace the broken component. This is what you do when you work on industrial electronics too. It's the same thing, So, which I have a really hard time getting people to learn how to do. But if you can learn how to do it, then maybe you can get a job doing this. Either way, guys, you come to Brian Phillips RC so you can learn something new. You learned something new you didn't expect it tonight. You're welcome. Come back for more. By the way, don't forget, we have a Patreon. If you want to help pay us for our terrible amounts of labor, teaching you how to fix gimbals that shouldn't be broken, then you can use the Patreon. There's also a PayPal site if you want to do a one-time gift. We really appreciate those things. But we hate to beg for money. The best way you can support us with finances, which is what we're looking for right now to get from where we are now to where we want to be, it would be buying these planes from the links. Let Horizon give us the money. Punish them. Give us the money. Um, and what's going to happen is there'll be a small commission that comes to us in lieu of you having to make a donation to us through Patreon or PayPal. And by the way, Patreon right now, we have set up so there are no benefits. The reason we do that is because obviously the benefits have already been received by watching these channels. But then secondarily, there are taxes that have to be paid for international users, some international users, not all. But some, some countries require you to pay a sales tax because you're getting a perk. So it's very complicated for us to do that. And I think it kind of undermines the whole point of what we're trying to do with Patreon, which is giving you an opportunity to support us for what we're already doing on YouTube. Let's be honest, nobody else is putting out six hour videos about apprentices, correct? Pretty sure. All right guys, come back for more.